Hey there, gang. In today's video, we're going to be taking a critical approach on one of the perks and one of my favorite builds that a lot of people aren't entirely sure about. The three other perks that I do run in the build, they very much can understand how they work together, but it's the fourth one that they aren't really sure how it really helps the build, what its real purpose is working together with the other perks. It feels very gimmicky to others. Some think that you can get better value out of substituting it for a different perk. And while that could otherwise be true, it could otherwise not be true. In fact, it could very much be a result of that decision to swap out this perk for another perk that causes this build to fall apart. This build is very fragile, and we'll get more into that. But first, it's important to mention exactly what perk it is that I'm talking about. This fourth controversial perk, with its own distinct and unique form of nuance, is play with your food. Now, play with your food. A lot of people, they see this perk as very gimmicky because you have to see the obsession to get value. You only get it for a single swing, miss or hit. And it doesn't entirely, I guess, on the surface, translate how much value you can really gain from it. And I'll quite honestly be a little bit fair. It's a little bit hard to say how valuable it would be before Rapid Brutality came out. But the role that this plays you could think of it as more supportive in nature. It is uh, very, I would even say, protective. Because the idea behind play with your food in this build is it's meant to protect the other three. Now, first things first, to kind of give a brief description of the build. This is the build that I've discussed in a previous video that you know, I'll link in the uh, description that I call my Gate of Death build. Now, this build is a hyper-aggressive build. It is probably the most aggressive and strongest clown build that I've ever put together. This build has the greatest lethality possible on clown. I want to be very, very clear about that. This build has the greatest lethality, but it's not perfect. It has downsides, not just due to the sheer fact that it lacks gen perks. You know, it has downsides through save the best for last. Okay, save the best for last. See, these are the three strong perks of the build. The ones that will get you the most consistent value are Coup de Gras, Rapid Brutality, Save the Best for Last. This is because you can hit a survivor, you'll recover quickly through Save the Best for Last, okay? And then you'll gain Rapid Brutality. And you can either use your bottles to uh, influence the speed. And then from there, if you have to, confirm the down with Coup. This is really, like I said, you'll be seeing most of your value here. However... What happens if you hit the obsession? Well, you're going to lose two stacks. That's a decrease of momentum. If the obsession has a med kit, that is very strong pressure that is going to be converted against you if you're putting pressure on, an, uh, on another non-obsession injured survivor in chase. Because if that enables them to get to a strong tile, if that obsession then heals, you're down two stacks, you're down a lot of time, you don't have corrupt, you don't have deadlock, you don't have any other perks, that's going to be bad. Because in addition to not only stalling out that chase, in addition to dealing with the contentious problem, like I said, of the generators getting completed, of the med kits, your chase, uh, you're going to be down momentum going forward, okay? It's going to take you time to recover that momentum, put you back to that baseline you previously established, and then go forward. So how exactly is it that you deal with that? Well, you have to provide protection for save the best for last. That's my whole idea behind play with your food. Because, again, this is your power. I call this the powerhouse three, Okay. Coup de Gras, Brutality, Save the Best for Last. This is where you're going to be getting most of your, most of your, uh, your, your strength and chase. How well you do is going to hinge on this combined with your power. However, this can support these other three in addition to providing a layer of protection for Save the Best for Last. Because you don't need protection for Rapid Brutality. Rapid Brutality does its job. It's free. It's it, the meme. It's free real estate. That's literally what it is. Free 5% haste doing your job. Good. It, it, that's a wrap. That's all she wrote. Coup de Gras. This is two tokens per lost gen. You're going to be losing gens. 
regardless of even if you're running gen perks, you will be losing gens. You know, I've seen some people comment that the value from this is limited on account of you needing to lose gens. You will be losing gens. So that's a non-factor. This does not really need any layer of protection because its protection is validated through its own consumption, counterbalanced by how many stacks you can actually hold. Five stacks is a lot of stacks, gang. You know, so that's good. You don't really need anything for that. This, though, is what you need the protection because it is the recovery on the first and one on a, a healthy survivor where you gain the brutality that you can combine with the bottles and then into the coup, assuming even if you didn't coup for the first and one for the save, that gets you that down. Okay, gang? So if you are losing save the best for last stacks, if you are throwing them away because you have an obsession who inserts themselves into your chases, that is going to cost you games because you don't have corrupt intervention. You don't have deadlock. You don't have pop. You don't have pain, you know, pain resonance. That is the essence behind this build because, again, while you are lacking those perks I just previously mentioned and some might initially uh, cascade, you know, just completely just ignore all nuance to the strengths of it, while you don't have that, this is, again, the greatest lethality you will ever get in chase, okay? You will not get greater lethality. It's just a manner of maintaining that lethality, keeping momentum, carrying it forward, if not even increasing it, okay? That's what it's about here. So this is your powerhouse three, and this is your protection. Play with your food is your protection. Because whenever the survivor inserts themselves into your chases, if they even so much is blink, like they, they even get close to you, then you are essentially gaining a you are gaining rapid brutality until you gain a health state and you know, until you take a health state from a survivor and that is very you know that that isn't that isn't just so much limited to taking healthy to injury you can down a survivor with that you know i've had and there will be some matches showcasing this where I have just farmed up stacks intelligently of play with your food due to both macro and micro decisions from the obsession and then insert, inserting themselves into my proximity and using that to kill their teammates. You know, that, that's, a, that's a funny expression. I, I've literally used multiple times. If the obsession keeps coming by, I'm going to feed off of them and then use it to kill their teammates because that's literally happens multiple times, gang. This perk is very insidious. You know, it, it lurks under the surface just like the fact that it's literally a spider. You know, you pay no mind till it till it strikes because that's the thing. When you build up stacks off of this, if the obsession doesn't play around the fact that you have this, you will win from it because one stack equals one health state. You don't need, I want to be very clear about this. You don't need two stacks to get value from this. You need one. One is basically maintained rapid brutality. And when it comes to actually using it, and gaining brutality afterward, you're not actually losing the momentum that you gained from getting that initial health state from play with your food. You're just not gaining anything beyond that because you're trading in the play with your food for rapid brutality. But we'll kind of talk about that more later. That's something I like to call token exchange. Um, beyond that, that's kind of just, in essence, the idea behind what really, really makes this so strong, though. This is your protection. <clears throat> Without play with your food, this becomes very susceptible to losing you the game if an obsession inserts themselves into your chases. You trade in stacks that become recovered. You know, health states for trading a health state to stacks becomes recovered, costing you the game. That's kind of a problem, all right? But let's, <clears throat> let's assume on a more, you could say, imaginative basis. I, I like to say imaginative because I really do have high bar expectations. And what I mean by that, let's assume you have an obsession who doesn't insert themselves in these situations, right? An obsession who doesn't get involved with you. They don't body block. They don't come around you. They're running distortion, urban evasion. They're doing gents. You know what I mean? They're hiding in lockers, you know, with quick and quiet, right? You have one of those types of obsessions, right? Well, then technically the idea of substituting play with your food for another perk, yeah, it kind of does hold some merit. And I've seen some people run a very similar build to this where they do that. You know, I've seen some people run superior anatomy. 
You know, with the uh, let's go ahead and shift over to it with the extra vault speed and superior anatomy is a, I mean it's it's a great perk, but it's literally I would almost argue just as niche because most of the value you're gonna gain from superior anatomy are on those windows that you literally would have to vault. So garden of joy main building, you know, Hanfield main building, absolutely you would want this perk. Uh, 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 yeah, of course, but it's and and even so. Well, I say absolutely, like, that's not to say you wouldn't still down a survivor before they get to the window regardless. It's just that if there were ever a time to vault the window, you would probably gain more value from this versus even two to three stacks, maybe, right? It, it's, it's a little bit circumstantial there. You know, it's not 100%. I could, I'm just saying I could see it there. But even so much as talking about that, I still want to pay respects to that. That speed goes a long way, gang. You know, if, if a survivor, you injure a survivor, right, we're talking recovery from this and this, you know, the idea even saying that, that they would get up there still should be a little bit far-fetched. So it goes a little bit both ways, but I definitely could see it. That is a substitute, but again, as much as we're kind of saying, oh, I'd run superior anatomy, yeah, it could kind of work, but this is, you know, could still do the same thing. Remember, this all hinges on the fact that the obsession doesn't get involved. You know, if the moment the obsession does get involved, this becomes worse. I want to make that extremely clear. So, like, that is that is one thing. This will get you similar value. This could be better, right? This will get you similar value. Play with your food as pure anatomy. This could potentially be better, but until the, but when the obsession gets involved, that goes down. That goes into the tanker, okay? You know, I've seen some people, in some cases, run brutal strength. You know, brutal. I mean, I kind of get it. In the same fashion, right? I mean, first thing comes to mind, gang, Gideon Meat Plant. Like, you know, some people heard me semi-recently rage about this shit, right? Gideon Meat Plant, when you get intelligent survivors, they will go pallet, 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 pallet. And this is something that you literally cannot play against, especially if they have made for this when it comes to chaining the tiles, especially if they have resilience for the faster vaults, even if you have coup de gras. You know, you can't play around this without kicking these pallets. So, like... Maybe some intelligent bottle combination usage with that. And, you know, I could kind of somewhat see it, but it's still niche in that regard. And again, same problem. No play with your food, active obsession, lose momentum, lose the game, especially on a map like Gideon. We're talking about Gideon with respect to where this would be the most valuable. You lose stacks and save the best for last. Even if you're kicking these pallets faster. I mean, you're, you're, you're just as much giving them as free pallets anyways. It's making no difference. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're literally doing a different action to achieve the same outcome. That's the best way I could break it down, which is worse. You know? I mean, I, I've seen... Now, other than that, I've seen some people's run... What was it? Sloppy Butcher? Let's go to Sloppy Butcher. Sloppy Butcher, I think, is probably the most sensible of the choices, potentially. Uh, especially if you have incredibly fast chases. I, I for whatever reason, I'm not able to use the alphabet but yeah sloppy butcher the thing about sloppy butcher is when you are taking here it is gang forget <laughs> when you are taking survivors uh on a very short chase you down them you hook them you go for your next chase your second one identify it quick hit let's say you've already built up stacks to save the best for last you know you go the yellow bottle before the injury with your eight stacks recover quickly pick up the yellow Rapid Brutality, Coup de Gras to the down. That's quick as shit, right? You get a super fast chase, down that second person, hook them, right as you're hooking, number two, number one gets unhooked. You are now able to rotate back to that hook because of that chase, right? And you're able to likely catch them because Sloppy Butcher, you know, increases that healing time. You catch them while the person off the hook is still injured. You know, hell, maybe it's the person who unhooked them is also injured as well. You've got two injured survivors, which means depending on where both survivors split, vulnerable or not, you know, maybe the person off the hook goes to a rough tile, the other person goes into a dead zone. Just take the free quick hook because you've got absurd lethality without even, you know, getting that save the best for last and brutality just through coup, you know, bottles and everything, right? Especially if you've played with your food. Well, actually, no, we're talking about butcher. Forgive that. <laughs> But, you know, like, that's that's kind of the deal, right? You then get that quick down, and then you go straight back to that person off the hook, gang. 
that's that's a really really big deal that sloppy butcher in place of play with the feud and to say would enable you because if you again this is a big deal i want to i want to emphasize this because it's relevant and when it doesn't happen think of this as almost like a swinging pendulum or a coin flip it's really one of those types of analogies because literally what this hinges on when it comes to substitutions if the obsession does not get involved your variety of viable substitutions for play with your food go through the roof in this build because again powerhouse three this is your powerhouse three your substitution play with your food goes through with a non-active obsession however the moment they do they go into the tanker because what happens if the obsession gets involved yeah you get a uh, sloppy injury you know but if you're not committing toward the obsession they're still going to complete that action you know what I mean? You're still going to be down that momentum. If they're still hyperactive on gens and it's not a strong map, it's still going to make no difference if the healing time on the people off that hook over there is faster. You, you really, really get what I'm saying here, gang? So, like, it's still really, really good, but it has, again, that same flaw as all of the other perks have. Now, there are some others which I think are very similar in value, but, again, it really does hinge on, again, a lot of some, you could say, niche factors. Pain resonance. Pain resonance giving you that 25% Instant regression now is really damn good. If you can identify that gen, then you can capitalize pressure off of that with your uh, strong lethality from the powerhouse three. If those survivors are injured that were on that gen, oh my gosh, that is crazy insane pressure. So that could be really, really damn good. And that's probably one of the best, I would say, I would say arguably this is the best of the generator uh, regression perks for that reason, because you will catch injured survivors with this perk off guard and then this lethality gets you the kill they, they just die that's it and that's a big deal because if they're a first hook second hook that's insane pressure if the moment that if they've been hooked once and you identify the gen of an injured survivor and you take them out with powerhouse three that's that's insane pressure okay so yeah that that's actually really good it's just again non-active obsession um lastly jolt uh jolt is probably the second best i would say i would say i don't like i don't some people like pop i want to briefly say i don't think pop works into this because pop slows you down too much pop says you got to do other shit that's not chases this is chase this is not kick gens okay so i don't think pop works with would work with this at all especially as a substitution with a non-active obsession i do think however that jolt would work because jolt does not i don't know my alphabet at all gang forgive me uh, Jolt literally does not change anything at all about what you do. This is literally just you down a survivor, you keep the motions going with nothing changes, and you get greater momentum on the regression. You don't have to touch anything to get that value. You know, there are some times I will base kick gens because I have to and it's smart. This means I usually will not have to, and I even get some extra 8% uh, extra on top of it, and that's a big deal, gang. So that's that's definitely... Uh, that's definitely something to keep in mind. However, you know, it's it's just despite all of the strengths of these substitutive ideas, I really think they fall short of the protection, the protective value that comes from play with your food. Play with your food quite literally enables you to maintain the momentum that you gain from your save the best for last so you can support the other perks in the powerhouse three. You can convert your lethality, your strongest lethality possible from these perks to get the greatest uh, greater baseline that you otherwise would get more limited as a result of an active obsession and you can possibly even do better you can do better because of that five percent because that five percent stacks with your bottles along with the other five percent and it also synergizes due to fast recovery to follow up on the health states from your save the best for last especially with your coup and for the down in fact even on that brief, brief note gang this means that when you are lunging with your coup lunges you are lunging faster you are going farther you know, so this does have that benefit as well on the side. It's it's a very strong supportive perk, but the way I truly see it, gang, and I want to make this very, very clear, this is the expression. Quiff is the protection. Stabiffle is the Achilles heel. Quiff is the protection. Okay, gang? So if play with your food is supposed to be the protection, how exactly does it work and how does one gain value from it? Basically, the way a survivor counters save the best for last is they want to insert themselves between you and the you and your non-obsession targets so that way you can't down them because they know that you're going to likely have to hit them. 
And if you do, you're going to be trading in your stacks to save the best for last, trading in momentum. And again, you know, with a build like this, you can't afford to trade in momentum in situations like this early into the game. The the only time, and we'll we'll talk more about this later, the only time that it's ever really worth hitting a obsession and injuring them uh, and trading in your save the best for last stacks is when you're down to three survivors remaining. Because when there are four survivors on gens, you need all the momentum you can get until you take a survivor out of the match, all right? Now, the value of play with your food, how exactly does it work? So what this perk does is this perk punishes the obsession for coming anywhere near you. Anywhere you go on any map, if the obsession is in any type of sense nearby, you can translate a very quick starting of a chase into an injury onto another survivor or a down if they're injured you know that's that's another part too but the biggest value that you'll see is getting that injury because normally what you'll see with this build is unironically the injury should be the hardest part even with made for this the injury will be the hardest because you don't have the support of brutality you know you aren't usually getting those hits in when a survivor isn't protected for the follow-up and they won't be ready for the save the best for last right you know things like pre-running and whatnot those are typically where you know you will see the most value from that right so that is that is where getting the injury from play with your food is going to be so pinnacle because if you don't have brutality if you don't have this for the follow-up and they're pre-running things like that and you're going to need something to get them before they get to strong tiles. That's where play with your food comes in handy because play with your food means that you can pick up a stack on an obsession who happens to be nearby. You can get an injury onto a survivor, turn it into rapid brutality, and then from there you can possibly get the down. You'll recover quickly from save the best for last. I call this the speed cycle, you know, the whole M1 into brutality and a save the best for last with the coup, the speed cycle. You get that down. That is something that you probably would not have been able to do as easily. It probably would have been a lot harder, especially when you look at the dynamics of physically making it early to a strong tile. You know, if they are able to do that because you didn't have this perk and I have had that happen multiple times. I'm going to be very, very clear. This is There have been situations where it was because I got the injury before they made it to a strong pallet. They abandoned the strong pallet, possibly without dropping it. You know, I've had that happen. They just don't drop it. They save it for next game. You know, I like to say that expression. And I'm able to get that down because they don't have anywhere strong to go afterward. All right? You know, you trade in that play with your food for the brutality. And you're supported by the best for last to follow up with the coup. The speed cycle gang this is a support for your m1 and that's that's what's so good because one of the ways i like to say that you utilize this perk <coughs> the way you think you get value from it is that you think of it like you're playing michael myers you know the way you stalk a survivor so normally you want to you want to find a survivor you know like myers you stare at him you build up your meter kind of in a way it's very similar to that except instead of doing that you're starting a chase you want to do what i call manipulate the chase mechanics there's a certain distance between a survivor and you when a survivor starts running if a survivor starts running and you are at a certain distance between them and there is line of sight you will trigger a chase and that's all you got to do to get value for play with your food when you are trying to build up that layer of protection and even not even building up the layer of protection, you know, you're, you're supplementing, you're taking advantage of poor positioning from the obsession in order to get momentum going into a non-obsession chase. They may not even necessarily be trying to get involved with you. You know, that that's something we will cover in a couple of examples because this is a big part of macro decisions is that when you are cognizant of the obsession's location, and you are, have an understanding of manipulation mechanics, you can very easily and quickly gain these stacks of play with your food without any type of consequence, and then you can go and trade that in for a health state. 
that is the best way I would like to say one should understand play with your food. Play with your food, one stack equals one health state. Two stacks of play with your food, that's a down. That should be a down. The moment you hit two stacks, you should perceive two stacks as I need to find a survivor, healthy or not, and I'm hooking them. Because what you will do is you will trade in one of those stacks for brutality, which will set you back at the same baseline speed as before you had brutality, while also having the quick recovery from save the best for last. And you have the follow-up from coup de gras. And you can set this up further by throwing a yellow before you get that injury. You will gain the yellow after the save the best for last recovery. And with remaining bottles, you can use a pink bottle to slow them down, either so they don't make it to something like a pallet or a window, or even if they do, you force the medium vault instead of the fast vault due to the intoxication, and you're able to catch them due to the lunge off of that, all right? There are a lot of dynamics at play here that purely are a result of play with your food. And, you know, earlier I mentioned it's very insidious because truly that's what it is. A lot of obsessions you go against are not going to play around this. You know, unless unless this somehow, I'm, I'm just saying this becomes a very big popular meta, most of the obsessions you go against are not going to be playing against a clown that has play with your food. Because it, it's, it's something that, you know, most will take the save the best for last. They're ready for that. They're not ready for this. And if you are, if they are feeding you stack on stack on stack, and without realizing what they're really doing, then it's going to be too late. It's going to be by the time you've killed their whole team that they realize that they are partly responsible for it. Because, again, one stack, one health state. If you don't need two stacks because you have brutality with the best for last, it's six to maybe eight stacks to follow up with the coup when you had the yellow and the pink. I mean, gang, and that's why I'm breaking it down, you know, step by step, you know, inch by inch like molecule like that's that's what it's all about gang that's there there reaches a point when you stack up all of the numbers that there truly is nothing anyone can do all right and that is something that would you would not be able to do without play with your food because it's it's not just about whether or not they try to body block. Let's let's mention that. We've talked about the other areas, but what happens when a survivor gets involved and you have play with your food? You can start the chase with them very easily. You can rotate around the tile in a certain way so that you can set up your bottles preemptively so you rotate back into them, maintain the momentum, right? So like as an example, if I'm on a, a side of a wall chasing a survivor, and they're coming up to a tile, what I can do is I can start the chase. We have an obsession between me, obsession between me and a non-obsession. When they are going to this tile, I can purposefully, by virtue of going that start the chase, I'll come around to the left. They're going to the right. I go to the left. Throw my bottles back on where I was on the right. Rotate back in with the momentum on the recovery, right? We're talking a yellow. Go through the yellow. Put the pink on the other. I will have already canceled chase with the obsession. I will have gained a stack of play with your food. I will be going through my yellow, slowing them with my pink. And I can either go around that obsession before they get anywhere. I can coo around them before they get anywhere. Or what I do... It worst case scenario is I start the chase again. If I have to, I will injure the obsession. They will leave. I will gain rapid brutality. The chase with them will end again. I will gain save or uh, play with your food again, doubling it too. And then from there with coup de gras, save the best for last, and my bottles, that should still be a down. All right. And now, as a result, in addition to that down. Whether or not that's a second hook, that's a third hook, taking that survivor out of the match. The obsession's injured. The obsession is now injured. And so what are the other two survivors? What are the state of them? Are they nearby to that obsession? Are they looking to heal them? Are they injured? Are they healthy? Have they been hooked at all? These are all really important. What items are they using? Do they have med kits? Do they not? You know, because what that means 
is that if I am able to injure that obsession following what I just mentioned as a result of gaining that play with your food stacked on the brutality, the, you know, coup, the yada yada, everything we stack into our build, what that means is I can snowball off of that. I can snowball. I can say, okay, well, she's injured. Someone may look to heal. I either try to identify both where she's going. Maybe if that's nearby a gen, I do somewhat efficient macro movement in place of both. I identify where they're at. I find them. Well, that means I can start a chase with them and that I can get a down that comes, that turns into a win for the game. Because what happens if I down that survivor? And then as uh, following that, you know, like I chase someone else and I down the second survivor. Well, then that leaves a third one. You know, if we took someone out of a match as a resulting of everything that I said and we're capitalizing off of the injured obsession pressure, that means that we can just purely win the game by slugging. Because we'll find someone healing the obsession, down them, catch the obsession, down them, one person remaining. They can't be doing gens. Down them. That's a wrap. That's a win. You know, your, your, your chances of winning with this build, because it's pure lethality, go up exponentially, both when survivors are injured and when there are less survivors on the map, you know? And it's it's purely, you're going to be able to do that if you play around the cooldown. Remember, there's a cooldown, and it's very interesting. I actually just noticed this. They don't mention the cooldown in the tooltip for play with your food. They just mention the speed bonus, but there is, I believe it's an 8 second cooldown. But when you learn to play around that, when you learn to uh, learn how to manipulate mechanics where you start the chases so you can break them early, and you take into account where you know survivors are going to be on account of where the obsession, that's where you get the most mileage out of this. It's a protective layer for this perk that you can learn how to trade in stacks to get a, a stronger exchange. Like, that's... Like, that's, that's the best way I can really break it down. I, I, uh, we're going to be covering some examples in this video. You know, this is the preliminary way that I like to kind of explain how everything works out, typically when I run this perk. Because I get this asked a lot, you know, just as a brief, again, you know, people ask me, how do you run this perk effectively in this build and how strong does it really work, and you know, in that manner. So that's what that is. But coming up next, what we're going to do now is I have a few matches. We're going to be talking about those matches, and we're going to be looking at things frame by frame, talking about how things worked in a certain way and the value we gained from play with your food, especially, but also in tandem with the other perks in our build. All right. So without further ado, you know, I'll let y'all see the first match. I won't say any spoilers and, you know, we'll talk about things after and I'll see y'all in a few. Alrighty, Ormond. Yeah, Ormond, the main thing Ormond only really has going against Cloud. We're going to be coming to this map, visiting it, um, to really, really look at it more closely in the next couple months. And I'm not just here Survivor Movement. I actually thought I did. Here's the thing. I didn't want to overcommit this early into the game into a bad first chase when I could find survivors. Like, right now, we can start the chase with Gabe, right, Gabe? See, we already know Gabe's here. Oh my gosh. This is so good, this is so good, because look, Gabe's gonna end chase, gang. Now we have play with your food and rapid brutality. Holy shit, you can't, look at how fast, gang, look at how fast we are. Did y'all see that shit? We whoop, like holy shit. They dumped a lot of time onto this gen, so we will go ahead and kick it. I'm not gonna kick the pallet though. I don't feel like we need to do that yet. Ooh, we are so taking hill. This is a really good hill, by the way, especially with the way this rotates. I think this is like one of the best hills we've got in a while. On this map. Just give me a chase. I just want to chase. Thank you. Now we go back. Because now we can definitely use that over here. Main's clear. Can I get anything on Soma again? This might be a bit of an overextension just to get a Pwift stack. This is very much an overextension, but we'll still get it. We, we at least still got it. 
this is an overextension, but at least we get to compensate by having another stack if they manage to heal him. Holy shit, the power of Q and two stacks. Holy fucking shit. Can I get a stack up from you? No? Okay, we're gonna go back. That was so fucking fast, gang. Holy shit, we, we came in at like Mach 10. Did they tap this? I feel like they tapped it. They did. So we will go kick it again. This is literally... I, I'm not reloading till I get a chase with a... There we go. I would like to kick that. Hold on. Let me go see if I can get an extra chase going. I'm willing to chase anyone else at this point too, by the way. This is probably a really stupid pickup. I'm gonna go this side now. I'm gonna drop a pink here because we know someone else is nearby, and I know he does when I get this gen done. I'm literally just farming him. Now I go kick this gen. I'm gonna go chase him immediately. We've got three. Like, y'all, look at how fast we are. Like, we are just so fucking fast. We just literally farmed the shit out of him. We're gonna get this hook here, and then we're gonna go back over there. Because we now, because we went for him, we have the most stacks. Why did I go for the Felix? Because Felix, I have three stacks, and he only has one health state. If I go for the person with one health state, I'll have the most for my next chase afterward. And now I can go for the person on death hook after kicking the gen when they spent all this time. That is so fucking bad, dude. I, I'm... Wow. That is so bad. Um... That's fine. Follow scratch marks at this point. Okay, we have good. Th now we're fine. Now we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Remember, we do have play with your food. Unless I fuck things up like this. Oh, that's a beautiful cross-up if I've ever seen one. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the fucking cross-up of the century! Let's go! <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Yeah. I have no problem hitting you now, bub. Because now I can after- here's the thing. That's so good, because I'm still getting a play with your food stack. I'm leaving you injured. I still have six stacks. I still have Q. Like, I could snowball off of his injury. If I end up downing one of the other injured person and he's nearby, I could turn that into two slugs. And if I find the third person, I win the game. I want to get one more stack of play with your food. Okay, never mind. He got off last second. I was trying to grab him to save my stack. That was insane. Thank you. Go ahead and put him on a hook right over here. Yeah, we're just gonna have to go for hook pressure because um, we still have plenty of gens. And also, uh... Ooh, beautiful. We're gonna take this yellow instead. It's right here. Think she alive, huh, gang? <laughs> Hook 
put this, go put that there. I actually want to put her as close as I can this way, believe it or not. I'm going to get her about right on this hook. This is a really, really good hook. We do kind of need to hurry. That gen could go. That gen's probably going to go. Someone else is here. Ah, I shouldn't have thrown that yellow. They're not here. Holy shit. Okay. Kick this. Good, 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 good. I'm going to go ahead and kick that one pallet as well, by the way, gang. Um, we're going to kick this. Get out the way. What's up? How you doing? I am doing fine. I'm doing good. Thank you. How are you doing? Damn. Not exactly a good spot to be in, though. Yeah, we spread our hooks a lot. Uh, I do want to leave this open like that. Um, are they on this? I don't see any pistons, so I'm going back. Like, they literally could just be backdooring this, like, right now. In fact, he tapped it, didn't he? He didn't. I don't think she realizes that... I'm not gonna give him a chance. I didn't want to risk him having for the people, so we're gonna hit him. Hooker here, kick that gen. I think we're in an okay spot. Still regressing, hot damn. Okay, we go check here then. Oh no, he didn't make this. Good shit, power Q. Hook him as close as we can to her, so that way if the Felix unhooks her, we can go straight for them. This way all he can otherwise do is pop the gen, but if he- oh, We'll just reload in that case. Yes, distortion. Chase, good chase. <laughs> Ooh, hey, Charlotte. Uh, hey, Charlotte, how are you doing? Yeah, definite slug fest. I mean, hey, that's where this build pops off. Close game, very close game. Everybody on death hook, we spread our hooks. I'm curious what their perks are, gang. So he had made for this. That's one. That's one value you gain, by the way. Well, uh, you know, not committing to the chase from the game in this instance, right? Is that we didn't have to worry about his three percent because we're with our five percent. <laughs> only, only he was the only one though. Um, pretty, pretty chill build on the Jake D. That residual uh, manifest actually fucked me up. I'm not even kidding. Let's say GG will play. Um, <laughs> meme build on the Felix. Yeah, GG is the so when it comes to matches which showcase how to get value from play with your food as well as how strong it could be, this is probably my favorite match for that as of recent. Now before we get started talking about what actually took place within the match, it's important to go over the builds that the survivors were running. I always like to do this at first. So 
first things first, you know, we always check for made for this. Uh, now, as, as of recent, that is kind of the go-to perk when it comes to providing any type of resistance. You know, I know even with the lethality we have, that 3% may not seem like much. And in a lot of circumstances, it's not going to be. However, we're, we're going to mostly be looking at putting emphasis still on whether or not survivors have it purely because of the early stages of our matches when we need to ramp up our pressure. We don't have a lot of hooks, given that we don't have corrupt, we don't have deadlock, you know, we haven't built up our save the best for last stacks, our first chase doesn't have the strength of coup de gras, you know what I mean? So like, th when it comes to all of those factors, that is kind of where made for this will be still rather strong. And seeing that only the Obsession, right, that's who Gabriel Soma is, the Obsession, he's the only person with made for this, that's probably some of the best news we could get for the whole match. Because that means we are going to be getting standardized chases when it comes to the expectations out of the survivor's movement. And from that, the strength that we have from our bottles, from our perks, that is going to put us at such a level that it's going to be borderline difficult for them to overcome it. <clears throat> so the other survivors, we have a rather hiding Talita, you know, Distortion, Calm Spirit, good exhaustion perks with a toolbox. The Felix, kind of a meme build, he had some self-reliance with the healing and the pebble. You know, the, the Felix really comes off as solo queue, I think, to me in this team. Jake with some kind of, uh, you know, flashlight shenanigans. And he actually got good value from that blast mine. That blast mine was actually really damn good. It didn't work out in his favor in the end, but getting hit with that blast mine, and we'll talk about that, that was a big damn deal. You know, I've always said I felt like blast mine was very underrated. Blast mine can change the shape of some of your games because typically when clown is kicking generators he's doing it after hooks or he's doing it before committing to a chase because he feels like the survivor is in a vulnerable bleh, he feels like the survivor is in a vulnerable position so if the survivor is able to turn that vulnerable position into a safe position due to the killer trying to bite off more than he can chew and kick that generator and then getting stunned that can change the momentum against clown's favor you know now again the reason why it didn't work out was because he didn't have anywhere to go to make it safe but that's just something i did want to briefly mention don't sleep on blast mine blast mine can be very powerful uh he also did bring ormond we weren't just sent here by random chance so that is something to kind of you know you could say take into account i mean i don't think it played the biggest emphasis when you look at their builds they didn't exactly shape their builds around the map offering that they were bringing but it's not exactly a very good map for Clown, Ormond. It, it has its pros and its cons. I even, I think, briefly mention it within the match itself. You know, the pros are that the tiles are typically not the greatest. A lot of survivors don't have the uh, understanding when you are playing at a very high level of Clown, especially when the, uh, we're talking strong tiles that are pre-drop. They don't know how to really deal with that. The, the real strength survivors have against Clown on this map are that you physically can't cross the map to handle these generators. You know, the, the one center generator especially has some very strong ways to escape for survivors to pre-run and otherwise displace themselves from you, making it very difficult in order for you to both can, uh, initiate a chase, especially injured or not, and convert it down into pressure. Okay, gang? Now, um, we've talked about Jake's first, talked about the Felix and the Toledas. That was basically kind of uh, what we really uh, should be looking at when we go into seeing what it is the survivors themselves were doing. But without further ado, I want to actually, what we're going to be doing next is I have, well, we're going to, I have the match itself pulled up. We are going to be playing the match at a faster pace, and we're going to be talking about a lot of factors in the moment, pausing and going forward about what was taking place in this match itself, okay? So let's see, first things first, we do this. Go ahead and do, give us a sec here, gang. This. And let's go ahead and get started. It's gonna be playing at a bit of a faster pace. I'll pause when necessary. So we start off on the other side of the map. You're gonna see our survivors are gonna be all the way over here. We take this pathing specifically because we know survivors can spawn here and someone did. The pre-running is why I didn't commit. Let's go back to that. Look at how far they were. 
Okay, they're already this far up. There's literally no reason to commit. There's no progress. We know other survivors could be doing other things. I thought I heard something, which is why I come around here. I don't hear anything. No one's on this gen. We've basically covered almost the entirety of the map on this side, so the only thing that remains is to push in this direction. I come from the right side because if I come from the left and they pre-run, they're going to be really, really, really far, and I'm not going to be able to play around that. If I come from this side and they attempt a pre-run, I can at least handle it better because they're going to be going this way, which is further from main. If they go this way, it's toward main. They have some pallets in that one building up here. Let's go back here. They have this one building here that they can take the window. If I don't double bottle combo, that's a lot of my bottle economy to set up on that. So it's it's ultimately just better to come from the right rather than the left. So we come from the we come from the right. We set up my yellow and see, look, this is exactly what I'm talking about. If I came earlier from the other side, they would have not only heard and seen it coming, she would have been much farther and I wouldn't have been able to handle it. Um, we, we aren't going to chase her anyways. But we get our yellow and what we see, two survivors. When you get familiar with different cosmetics, when you get familiar with survivor, what they, you know, like their, um, their hitboxes, I guess you could say, you start to know just by looking at ours, who is who. And I know I just saw Talita leave. I know that, you know, there, uh, there are three other male survivors, and I know that that bun you'll see on the left, that little, like, thing at the top, I know that's Jake, because I know that's a Jake cosmetic. I, I'm pretty sure there's, like, not a single other uh, of the people in the match. Soma doesn't have a cosmetic like that. You know, I know Felix doesn't have a cosmetic like that. That's Jake. So I know that that's Jake, and as I'm coming around here, I see this, and this doesn't entirely look like Felix to me, but I'm coming to find out. And sure enough, it's Gabe. So I pull myself out. I'm not even trying to hit him. There's no reason to entirely commit to hitting him. He is already so far toward this pallet. And in addition to being so far toward the pallet, he's the obsession. There's no real reason. Because see, look, he has possession of the pallet. Let's, let's uh, phrase it this way. This is pallet possession. I talk about this in my guide. I don't have possession of this pallet here. Because as we see, he drops it. If I would have attempted to commit, I would have gotten stunned. So we have no, there is virtually no purpose beyond initiating this chase. Because look, as we do this, we haven't initiated it yet, but it's right now. We start the chase. That's what I need. That's why, do you see why I'm looking this way? I am looking this way because how chase mechanics work are a chase does not start until a survivor starts running. If a survivor walks, a chase will not start. But if they're in your direction and they start running, it will begin a chase. And uh, what I'm trying to do here is initiate, based on the game mechanics, start a chase, even though I'm not actually going to chase him. So as I look this way, look, it starts to chase. I look around he, because the way chase mechanics also work is a survivor goes in the other direction. What's going to happen is at a certain point, because especially I'm not looking at him, the chase is going to automatically end. I also just hit the Jake. Jake is injured. Rapid Brutality is now active. So in just a second, and this is something I talked about. I'm breaking it down frame by frame because this is this is what I uh, talked about previously. This is chase mechanic manipulation. We are literally manipulating both starting the chase, ending the chase at a convenient time for us in order to create a situation that is uncountable for the survivor because the Jake is displaced in this corner. Jake can't get out from here. Once we get this hit, we recover. What's he going to do? Look, he's looking right. Notice he's now looking right. He wants to go right, but here's what he realizes. I'm sped up, and as I start to rotate, he's not getting anywhere. There's really nothing for him here if he attempted to, so he rotates back left. And I know that I need to get my yellow. I've got my play with your food. Play with your food now activated, just like I mentioned. We come back around. The whole reason of this movement, when you see me do stuff like this, is because I'm very confident and understanding that a lot of survivors... They see you take this movement, and they will they will attempt to subconsciously rotate in the other direction because they are trying to create as much distance from you as they can. So if you start going this way, even if you're not fully committing around this corner, right, where this tree and the rock meet, even though I'm not intentionally going around this tree and this rock, by virtue of walking close to it as if I am, it's going to push them away from it themselves on the other side. So I come in, I then go back, see, look, he already start to, he's actually really wide, which works out in our favor, and I walk into the pallet to simulate kicking it. I then pull out, because by virtue of that, it messes with his understanding of what it is I'm truly intending to do, and I throw this pink. This was purposefully placed and timed, and I did it very well. I want to make this very clear, this isn't a boast. 
because the idea behind this specific pink was to go on the right side of the tree over the rock and land as a cross up on the other side because look where Jake is. I knew if I threw this pink from this angle that based on, and this is a result of doing what I just mentioned, that be, and especially with this, that I would be able to catch him before he made it to the pink and if he walked into it, he would not have been able to make it back to the pallet. We have uh, Rapid Brutality still. We have Play With Your Food. We don't need Q. Hell, we don't even need those perks. I'll be quite honest with you, gang. You know, if we didn't even have Brutality or Play With Your Food, we'd still likely hit him just with a, with a basic lunge. And there's nothing for him here. He goes down. This is a dead zone. It's a quick first chase. We get our quick pick up here. And we use the Brutality to help us get our first hook. And this is where we start to really uh, begin uh, building our pressure. I get this yellow set up ahead of time. One important thing to know about yellows, this is kind of a habit that I do, is that the longer you stay in a cloud, yellow active or not, the shorter it will last. The duration of your bottles is based on how long a survivor or killer stands within them. If someone is not in them, they last longer. So I purposefully throw it outside of myself so I can pick it up in the event that I need to pivot or transition between it. So we get our yellow. We start looking. This is where we see we see a generator failed skill check. So I want to investigate this because this is still on the same side of the map as the person I hooked. I know I can afford to investigate this. I either get a quick hit, I uh, push them off the gen. I'm doing something while knowing that someone else has to get the person off the hook. So as I'm coming over here, I start to reload. I have no bottles. This is beautiful. This is literally what you want to see. The person on that gen was the obsession because my pressure is not really at a stage or even at a point necessarily just yet where I'm really looking to chase a whole whole lot of people if I can. And seeing that this Gabe in the corner of the map, the one who's sequestered from everything else, is the obsession. This means I can reload my bottles like so, initiate the chase through mechanics. Notice how I literally just hop off the hill to get close enough because he's running in the opposite direction to start the chase. And I go back toward the hook, throw my yellow, don't see anybody, pick up the yellow, I come back. The reason why I'm coming back here is because, look, play with the foods off cooldown. Can I start a second chase? I even mentioned this is a bit of an overcommit, but do you see how easy it was to get that chase to start? This is called, again, manipulation of chase mechanics. We don't even really see, look, we're looking at him right now. That starts the chase. That's all we had to do. We start that chase. We pick up our second play with the food stack. And it's actually because of this potentially <clears throat> that we were able to catch the Jake while he was still injured. You know, we don't have Sloppy Butcher. We don't have Mangled. They, you know, like if, uh, if they could have potentially been very close to this and we coo here for that reason. Look at how far away we are. This is not within standard lunge range. I'm cooing because based on how long it took, and remember this video is being played faster. So if it seems like it's not much time, the video is being played at a faster speed. So we lunge inward. They have to cancel the heel. That's a down. That's an immediate rehook. But more than that, I get another injury. Why? Because I'm trying to create that pressure. I know that she's not going to be able to pick him up just yet. He's got a lot of recovery time to do. I've got her injured, which means it's going to be in general very dangerous for her to even consider coming back. And further, look who's in front of me again, gang. Look who's right in front of me. It's Gabe. Now, I wasn't able to start the chase. I did try to. I wasn't close enough. So instead, what I'm doing, I just come back. I don't want to risk Felix coming by and doing something crazy. You know what I mean? We don't know at this stage what perks the survivors have. They could have had... a. Uh, we're going to live forever, things like that. Just some type of manner, even for the people, something to pick up the person I was tunneling. And I did not want that to happen. We come back, we rehook the Jake. We come to this gen because I know this gen is a lot of progress. We've got him on second. We know that we're kind of, they, we don't have to necessarily worry about the uh, unhook immediately happening right here because if it did, we could just punish the shit out of it. I was really confident on that. We get our yellow set up. We start moving. And this is Gabe. This is Gabe again. This is beautiful. Look how close, gang. This is what I'm talking about, how easy it is. This is how easy it is to manipulate chase mechanics. You get this close, you leave. That's a stack. That's all you got to do. I, I, that's why I kind of give it the Myers comparison. Because literally, it's almost like you stop, you leave. You know I mean? You build your tiers, like Ghost Face, I guess, too. Ghost Face works. You build your, uh, your stacks, you leave. And look, I'm already at a stack. I know my play with your food's off cooldown. This is probably one of the biggest reasons we were able to snowball so hard at this stage in the mid game because there is a gen that Gabe wants to work on but by virtue of working on it he displaces himself from the entire map all right 
So there are only three survivors who can unhook the, the Jake, you know, because those are the only people that are active. If Gabe is displaced, that means only two people can. It has to be Toledo or it has to be Felix. But they have to do it quick. They have to, because this gen does not have a lot of progress. And every time on an eight second cooldown that I initiate a chase with Gabe, I'm building up that momentum I'm talking about from play with your food. And it's this momentum that is going to allow me to kill his whole team. Okay, so we come over here. We start this chase. Look how easy it is. I start the chase. I leave. That's stack number two. And look, we see someone come. Y'all see that? That's what I'm looking for. This is exactly what I'm talking about, saying they need to move fast because the longer that they don't, the more stacks I build. We get our second stack because of how long it kind of took them to rotate. We see someone rotating, and this is where I know that I'm going to be able to get a lot of pressure because we have two stacks to play with the food. This means, and this is why I even say that I'm comfortable chasing somebody else, we're pretty early into the game still when it comes to gen progress. You know, that one gen Gabe was working on didn't have a whole lot. We're still technically at four. I haven't seen a whole lot of the others, but we know we've been keeping two to three survivors preoccupied for the, you know, for almost the entire match so far. And that leaves me in a position where I feel like I would actually create some stronger pressure if I just ignore the Jake for a minute. Yeah, I could have gone for him, but y'all, we have a pretty good amount of stacks of save the best for last. We still have coup, and we have two stacks to play with the food. You know, we'll be picking up rapid brutality, which means we maintain the same speed as if we had two. And that's a big damn deal when it comes to chasing a survivor that would otherwise be fresh on hook stages this early into the game. So we come over here, we get the pink. I believe that was, yeah, we threw the uh, the pink onto the hook. We already sped up our own yellow. And I actually ignore Jake because I know he still has base kit BT. I could hit this, but if I hit this, he goes all the way in. I could not hit this, try to wait it out, but what happens if Felix puts himself between us? He gets closer to a stronger tile. I may or may not hit him. You know, I don't even know where Talita is at this point, right? What if Talita is right behind me on the other side of the rocks? They were calming out that we need some extra support and they get between while Gabe is still working on that gen. That still could change things, gang. Especially if, due to how strong main building on Ormon could be, I had to break chase with the Jake. If I had to, you know, that would have been a really damn big deal. So instead, I opt for a different strategy. I hit the Felix. Because where is Felix going to go from here? Not really much at all. You know, Jake can somewhat get to main building, especially if we, like, leave him be. We're still sped up by our yellow. We have Rapid Brutality. And this is because of my, my stacks of everything, right? I still have the same speed, like I mentioned, Brutality plus Play With Your Food. I recovered quickly from Best for Last. And even if he was going to get close to somewhere, coup de gras. I still have one stack. You know, that buff really does help a lot, by the way. That buff is crazy when it comes to Chase Lethality. We get this pink on there just for getting the down faster. We save our stack. It helps ensure we do that faster. And we're able to push her off that gen before it gets completed. This is a big deal because you're about to see some crazy... Normally, I don't camp with this build, but this is where you need to identify situations where you punish by camping, okay? Keep in mind, up to this point, Jake is still injured. So we get this hook here, and I realized she was working on the gen to the right. She's working on this gen. I know Gabe's been working on this one. And there's the gen at main building. I have a, the Felix hooked within a very strong cluster of three generators, where one of the generators is vulnerable, it's displaced from everything. The other two generators, one of them is slightly vulnerable, the other one isn't, but by virtue of being so far from the hook, it doesn't really make it plausible for them to just meander between, I'm going to work on the gen, I'm going to attempt going for the hook. They have to commit to one of those decisions, which is good, because only, only two people are going to be able to go for this hook. And we'll talk about that in just a sec. So we see Gabe was working on the gen. We come inward. This is the same situation as before, gang. We're picking up these free stacks. We come in, initiate the chase mechanics. We leave. We're now at play with your food uh, stack one. No one's come from the hook yet. We're checking this gen. No one's come from the hook yet. I'm throwing a yellow here for two reasons. Not only in case someone's stealthing. Well, normally I was going to check. I was going to say I would check for main. That is one thing you could technically do just to see if someone was doing it. That is something that would have probably helped, but I still wouldn't have committed toward a main building chase, especially if the, uh, unless it was Jake. If I saw Jake, possibly, I wouldn't have definitely done it with Talita, who also has distortion, by the way. We wouldn't have been able to see her anyways. And yeah, so we come again. This is a uh, you know, number two electric bungalow. See how easy it was to start that gang. We come in, look at this. He's working on the gen right now. We're dropping off the hill. This is what I talk about when it comes to manipulating the chase mechanics. We drop back down here. We leave. It's that quick. Because what happens, gang? What was it that I said? To start a chase, a survivor has to run. You have to have line of sight, and that's it. 
You hit a, a certain distance, only a certain distance between the two of you. If he's running and you're looking at him, that starts the chase. We hop off this hill for just a sec. We reload. We hop off this hill, starts the chase. Stack number two. That easy game. That easy. Once the game says you start a chase, you just got to end it. Ending it's a lot easier than starting it. And look at this. We start chasing him again because look at this. We're about to get stack number three. See, this is literally what I'm talking about. The Gabe was displaced, okay? Let's go back. We're spending this whole time pressuring multiple generators, even with this build by camping, because we know that every time we hop off this hill, Gabe has to hop off the gen. And every time we hop off this hill to push him off the gen, play with your food. While he sits on the hook, which means only the Jake and only the Talita, those are the only people who can attempt this unhook here. But what happens if Jake goes for the unhook? He's on death hook. He has no anti-tunnel mechanics by virtue of the fact he was, you know, second hooked a long time ago. That means I can ignore this Felix. And that's literally what I'm banking on. I am banking on the person who comes for this unhook being the Felix because only Felix and Talita can do this. That means that if I catch the Jake, I can just straight up take him out the game. We have six stacks of save the best for last. I'm about to hit my third stack of play with your food. I still have a stack of coup. If this was Jake, I would just hard focus the shit out of him. But instead, it's not. It's Talita. Talita, the person we have not hooked yet. The person with distortion, right? So we don't put any attention on her. Instead, we pick up our third stack of Play With Your Food by virtue of initiating a third chase, uh, farming that stack off of uh, Gabe Soma. And we just... He, he can't do anything here. That door's uh, unbroken, so he can't go anywhere. And the speed differential means we catch him before he gets to any other window. All right? So we go ahead, put him on second state. This gives, this gives me two survivors on death state at this point. Which is good. You know, this is a good spot to be in. It does give me two targets to snowball, but we do need to get someone out of the game. And thankfully, we see the Jake. However, this is what I mentioned about Blast Mine earlier. This is a really, really, really damn time to get hit with Blast Mine. Residual Manifest kind of sucks, but that's not the problem. See, if this was not a generator in the corner, say this was a main building generator on this map, this would have really fucking sucked because it would have made enabled him to get to so many strong pallets at this point. Remember, we haven't gone to any of the pallets on main building on the top floor. So if this was bottom floor main building, I would have had an extremely rough time committing to an uh, uninjured Jake that was on death hook. You know, this would have probably been game. I would have had to have banged and chased and come back to the hook. Like, so that's a very big deal based on where you get hit with that blast mine. And it's again why I say don't sleep on it. It can be very damn strong situationally. Uh, depending on what the gen is and when the killer gets hit by it. But anyways, back to the match. So we get hit with that blast mine. We're a little bit panicky until we see Jake. Then I'm not concerned because look at this. He's behind this rock. He's got nothing there. He's not necessarily going to be able to make it to the right, especially with our two sacks of play with your food and our pink bottles if we need it. And he's not going to be able to make it to this pallet and he's not going to be able to make it to the tile in that back corner. So we just go ahead and drop a pink. He attempts it, but he actually, no, he does make it. Like that was my initial presumption, but no, he does make it because we fucked up our bottles game. Kind of fucked up our bottles. Let's uh, let, let's be honest here. We kind of messed up a bit. You know, we threw we threw our pink right over here, and it missed. And then he we missed the second one, and he didn't make it. But we salvage it because we get the yellow bottle cross up of the century. That is probably one of the best yellow bottle cross ups I've ever done. We get the injury, and this pushes him from the tile. Y'all need to understand. Part of the reasons I attempt shit like this is because not only are you literally getting such an efficient injury, like. The whole idea behind this play style with double bottles and attempting this shit is that you are literally, when you pull it off and you get good enough to pull it off consistently, your chase times are going to be dynamically so faster than if you just kick that pallet. It would be beyond comparison. So yeah, we fuck up our bottles here. He drops the pallet, but we get that cross up. And with the pink, we throw it through to the other side. That enables me to hit him here, which because the pallet is dropped and he gets hits here, this pushes him away from this tile. Without having to kick the pallet, he is pushed away from this tile. This pushes him toward main building, but that's the thing. Where does he go? How can he get anywhere? Will we maintain the same momentum from play with your food and rapid brutality? We recover with eight stacks of save the best for last, and we have two stacks of coup. You know, he attempts to get up there, and we basically almost catch up to him, even with no bottles remaining, just by virtue of sheer movement speed. Now, he would have made it to the pallet, possibly. Actually, no, he probably wouldn't have just with a basic lunge. But, you know, we had the coup for the insurance. And it's because of this that we now get our first kill. Gabe comes into body block, and this is one of the worst fucking times that he can do it. This is literally one of the stupidest times to come into body block. Because Jake is on death hook. And y'all are going to see. We get this injury. Look at this. We now build a stack of play with your food. 
I could go for the Felix. Remember, Felix is on death hook. Is that Felix even right there? Or is that I think that's actually the game. But here's the thing. If I found Felix at this point, because of what the game just did, I would not be at a 2k. Because Felix is on death hook and he's still injured. And I have played with your food. That he th this Felix almost just killed two people. So we go from here. We start trying to chase somebody. I'm really just trying to be efficient looking for anybody. I know he's injured. I was hoping at this point, because I know that the Felix is injured, maybe he tries to play this LT and I just farm a second stack because we're off cooldown. But we don't see that. Instead, what happens is he just goes down. And I figure, you know what? Getting this hook here, what this means is if somebody wants to come unhook them, I will know when the unhook happens through the unhook notification. And I play around that. If it's the Toledo, things are a little bit harder. If it's the Felix, we get our second kill. Now we see the Toledo here, which does mean the Felix has to unhook, and that's intentional. I purposefully commit to the chase for that reason. I expect it to come very quickly. We do have three stacks of coup. We do have a good amount of stacks to save the best for last, and I did start the chase with full bottles. But where things didn't go according to plan, you'll see right here is this live. I did not know she had live at this point. And this live bought her an extra... 20 25 seconds because it forces us to rotate around here we have to do this mind game i'm out of bottles have to reload my bottles shift in and then and then she takes the vault i realize she abandons the tile have to set up the yellow here and then i throw the pink she actually plays a very smart plays a very good with the vaults i still catch her in the dead zone but that bought her a lot of time and in the process they were able to fully heal off this hook and by the time i bring her to this hook i kick the gen i get rid of a pallet that's starting to seem problematic you know we'll go ahead and fast forward i kick the kick the gen come forward Kick this pallet. Things are start. Uh, I, I lose this last gen. Things are starting to look semi close because I need to get my second kill soon. If I want to actually win this game, I either need to snowball super fucking hard by taking multiple people down, or I need to get my second kill before uh, this last gen gets close to popping. Because remember, this one's starting to get close. You know, we're we're not exactly at one gen. We're at like maybe half a gen. And I I think Gabe fucked up here. He was trying to help support and accidentally body blocked. This allowed me to wait it out and build a stack of play with their food. The play with their food doesn't really matter here. But yeah, we get our down here and we get the injury. This is that injury pressure I'm talking about. Sadly, the chase ends too early and I don't get that stack again of play with your food um, for the you know follow-up. But we get her on second hook as well. This is now two survivors on second hook. And one nice thing about this you'll see is that we don't have to worry about 4%. But anyways, because we have everybody, every survivor's been hooked at least once now. But we start running around here. I'm not really as much concerned. Well, actually, yeah, 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 because he is injured at this point, And I know that I have the time for this and he can't make it to the window. I do end up going for this coup. And this puts him on second as well. And when you have two survivors that are simultaneously hooked, this is where snowballing especially becomes more prominent. Because who can unhook at this point? Felix. Felix is on death hook. Even in the worst case scenario where I can't catch any of these people, I guarantee my 2k by slugging the Felix here, okay? So I, I initially don't go for the Felix because I know she's injured, and her only protection from base kit borrowed time means that she can't get this unhook, so I just follow her. I'm literally waiting till she starts the animation. I'm not waiting out base kit BT necessarily i'm waiting till she starts an unhook animation and then i'm gonna swing and she notices this notice she pulls away she knows that i'm physically waiting until she starts the grab to hit her and she she knows that the smartest decision is to just leave she needs to create as much distance from the hook as possible this would allow felix to come in and get this unhook so I, she waits it out I, or rather she comes over here i wait it out i down her and here comes felix felix is able to make it in the last second but why does felix wait so long to come in gang why do you think that is Felix is respecting my lethality. This is something this build does, especially against someone who's on death hook, that you've hooked twice, that you took down extremely quickly. These survivors will begin to respect your lethality. So Felix ends up coming around here. He's staying very far from us, okay? Even though he's healthy, he's hoping that this base get BT does something without him having to. That's literally what he's banking on because literally what this Felix is thinking is that if I hit him once, then I am putting him uh, in a position where he's just going to die. The moment I even so much as actually commit to the next chase with him, he dies in 15 seconds. That is what his concern is. He is hoping that the attention I put onto the Toledo either enables the Toledo through Basket BT to uh, unhook the Gabe, or that it's going to maybe buy him time to do something afterward if I manage to somehow go away from the hook. 
you know, so we come over here again, we wait it out, we notice she doesn't unhook, she displaces us enough for the Felix, who is now healthy, he knows he has to unhook here, by the way, that when, when he sees Talita goes down, this is something to understand, if he does not unhook right now, this game's over, because he's not going to be able to get the unhook again, he comes in, he unhooks, we get the hit very early before he even starts, and the thing about this, is at this point, this game is over, he came in way too late, because what could have technically happened, Talita could have tried to run away, you know, try to get maybe a little bit away. I could start to get my hooks in if I didn't commit to a slug. Remember, she has distortion. Talita actually has distortion, so she probably could have immersed a little bit better. And then when I picked up one survivor, you know, she could have gone to try to pick up the other, right? Because with distortion, Calm Spirit, things like that, and the main building to support them in the background, actually committing to downing and full slugging the Toledo would have been a lot harder than it seemed. Because what happens if one of these survivors also had Unbreakable? Because remember, the game's not over yet. We don't know who has Unbreakable or not. You know, as far as committing for me to make that decision, would have been a little bit risky when I know that there are survivors that I could immediately pick up and hook to take them out of the game. All right, she could have then used that opportunity to pick someone else up, and it's not a four-man slug. Or rather, three-man slug. You get what I mean, gang? All of these are factors you need to take into account. Not just in hindsight, but in the moment. But once again, going back to what I said, because we were able to down the Toledo where she is, where she stands, regardless of how far she uh, was able to get, Felix himself, look how far Felix is, gang. Do y'all see that? Felix is so fucking far away. We recover quick enough to where we come up here. I don't even lunge, gang. I'm holding my stacks. I'm saving them for next game because we don't need three stacks at this point. But I'm still doing that. I get the hit in. I down him. And it's the same situation like I mentioned before with this Talita gang. You know, the base kit BT means she can't unhook and she's injured. So this is a guaranteed down. It's just a matter of when. We down her. Same situation. Come back over here. Hit the Felix once. Hit him twice. Even if this uh, Toledo is somehow magically ready to get picked up. She can't get picked up because if Gabe immediately touches her, which is what I was looking for, we down him. That's a slug. That's a wrap. So we come over here. He abandons. I throw the yellow. This was pre-planned. Um, I kind of didn't really like where I placed it. You know, I was hoping to go under the, the door frame, but it is what it is, gang. You know, we were still able to get the yellow because I expected him to take staircase. And I knew if I threw the yellow properly at this time. You know, I, I swapped to my yellow preemptively. If I get it right here, I could pick up the yellow, put the pink on the staircase. He's not making it in any pallets. None of these pallets would he make it to it. Coup or not, we didn't even need coup. And that's basically the wrap here, gang. That's the wrap. We were able to now hook him. He's already been hooked once, which means no Kobe's, no uh, 4%. Afterward, next survivor is, um, you know, or two other people. I believe both are on, yeah, both of these other survivors are on death hook. So this is another, this is kill, um... This would be kill number three. Yeah, all of them, I think, are actually on death hook. Yeah. So, and the, that's that's the 4K gang. You know, it came rather close in the end. They did get almost all of the generators done. But we were able to, during the mid game, even despite the fact that this is a large horizontal map, you know, we got so many stacks of play with your feet off, uh, off of Gabe. And we, we, at one point, like I said, we hit three stacks of play with your food going for that Felix. You know, even if he had, like, off the record, you know, when we hit him when we did, if he went to, like, Kill Shack, we would still have two stacks to play with your food for Kill Shack. He's not playing Kill Shack, you know what I mean? R regardless if we see his R or not. That's so much speed diff- Like, it, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to the lethality in this build, you know, with the perks that we have. We, we already have, with what I call the Powerhouse 3, an insane level of lethality, but- when you factor in how many stacks of play with your food we were building off the game, that hit us at that threshold that the survivors couldn't match. And it was basically free. You know, we go back to earlier in, right? When we have this survivor on the hook, y'all, we, we have him right over here. I come over here. I kick this gen. Let me go back a little bit further. Like, look at this. We hook him right here. Gabe can't unhook here, like I said. Gabe can't unhook here because we've got him cut into this corner. And he's not playing around play with your food. You know, as far as he's playing around health states, that's what he's doing, gang. He's playing around health states. He doesn't understand. He's not in, playing the same game that we are. We come here. We start this chase. That's the game that we're playing. You know, this gen does not have a lot of progress when we're coming in. Look at this. Let me go back a little bit more because we're playing a little bit faster. We get this hook. Get this in right here. And we start coming this way. Look at how many pistons are firing, y'all. Not a whole lot when we come in. About two pistons. There's plenty of time. Think about how long a single hook state lasts. 
There is plenty of time to rotate between Gabe on an 8 second cooldown to start these chases and build up these play with your food stacks. We go it, we do it not just once. I don't have time to kick this, by the way, and that's fine. I don't even need to worry about kicking it because it's got, like I said, so much time left. We come back around. We see nobody for the hook. I have time to come kick this because I know it has some decent pressure and it's just it's just efficient to do this with how it's right next to the hook. Obviously, it's not going to be the same with the patch changes gang um, with the anti-camping, but I digress. We pick this up here. And look, this gen, like I said, it's now up to three pistons, but it's still got some decent time. It's got enough time. We're now at stack number two. This gen hasn't been touched yet. We see that. Still, I believe, regressing. We get the pink on the hook, so we know if they unhook, we'll hear it and we'll slow them down. And look at this, gang. Cooldown's now expiring again. Stack number three. You know, this is what I mean when I say that the obsession cannot insert themselves anywhere near you. It's not only a layer of protection for Save the Best for Last because it prevents the obsession from coming you know, near you and not giving you something in exchange of two stacks of Save the Best for Last, but there are situations where you take your, you know, your Powerhouse 3 and you go even farther. Like I said, you reach that threshold. But I think that just about wraps up everything I could say about this map. We've covered everything, I think, in express detail, uh, you know, without going overly repetitive. So what we're going to do next, there is one, or there's another match we're going to be talking about too. And this one is going to be, I believe it is on Rotten Fields. It's on a Coldman map. And we were also able to get a very similar style and level of value from Play With Your Food. You know, farming those stacks and then converting them into health states and downs on the non-obsession survivors. So, without further ado, you know, I'll let y'all see that match and I'll see y'all in a few. Which means we're 20% of the way, gang. We are 20% of the way. To, uh, we're getting a lot of fucking corn tonight, y'all notice that? <laughs> to 10,000 of each eerie. That's a knee, I think. Crazier than not just see her. Honest, she has fucking distortion, dude. <laughs> How many birthday cake anniversaries have on Clown? Depends on each one. I've been playing for three different anniversaries now. I have three different cakes. We're gonna kick this and move. I was gonna say kick this one and move. Now we gotta kick this. I'm not gonna chase that. Kick this. That's gone now. Now I can't do that next time. We're gonna check this pallet. Excuse me. Check this gen. No one over here. I'm gonna have to go back, even if I even if I don't tunnel, I have to go back just for the fastest chase. Oh my gosh, dude! At least I didn't pop by a stack here. I could have hit that. I didn't think she would chain it like that. Holy shit! Oh my gosh, she's actually can't see, dude. That actually helped me. She couldn't see. I got the same hit anyways, as if like. beat her, man. I thought I could fucking beat her there if I fucking could because I would move so fast. Oh my gosh. And I fucking missed, dude. You are actually kidding me. Oh well, we literally perfectly timed the bottles at least, by the way. That was perfect bottle time. She did not get the yellow and we got the pink and we got with the yellow. So like, that was like perfect at least. I really should have probably tunneled, but I'm being a little bit chiller tonight, gang. Just a little bit. 
I'm gonna try to kind of play things like not at not at the ten. You know, I'm gonna I'm not gonna play things. I'm trying not to play things tonight. Cranked at the tenth gear. You know what I mean? We're kind of chilling at like seven or eight right now. Yeah, everybody's got fucking distortion tonight. Y'all see this shit? <laughs> you gotta love rotten fields. Holy fuck. I'm doing this so he doesn't go down on a pallet, by the way. That's why I'm using a Q stack here. I don't want him going down on this pallet and have to throw a yellow. If I Q him, I don't have to reload and throw a yellow without risking anything. Just got a free stack to play with the food. Go ahead and kick this too. We can afford to kick this as well as soon as she's still even nearby because of cooldown. Then we can go for the next one. I want to check these gens, but I also want to get another chase going. Now we'll go over here. I'm going to ignore that hook, and I'm going to try going over here now. This gen has no progress. That means I got to be over here. Like, yo, look at that. She doesn't realize how fast we are, gang. She had no, she has no fucking idea how fast I am. Ooh! Can you stop? Like, your shenanigans don't work because I am so fast. I am so fast. Can I go get another stack? Nia's probably over here, right? I'm gonna ignore her because I want to get the Nia. Yes, Nia. Nia, feed me. Feed me. Thank you. Now we go back. Remember, we can get one more stack easily off of this. Beautiful. Like, yo, look at how fucking fast we are. I'm not going basement. We're going closer. Why? Because I know Nia's likely over here. We could just go get another stack off of Nia. We're just gonna keep farming this Nia, y'all. Because she's got plenty of time on this gen. fucking matter if you have my yellow it does not fucking matter oh it does not matter holy fucking shit let's fucking go pop it off midair is it a bug that is a bug if they're changing midair when you swap that is a bug so she's on second we get dwight he's on death because y'all do y'all see how fast these chases are we got we got back to them as they just got off while they were still healing. That's how quick our chases are. We caught right back up. Almost double simultaneous. So we can take Dwight out, potentially go for her. Oh, I thought she was Nancy. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and kick this pallet now. She's actually still following me. Holy shit. One more. One more. Where the hell are they? So that's where they are. The 
doesn't fucking matter. I mean, she did waste all my stacks, but shh. Make sure no one's nearby. Like, I like how she just stood there and accepted her fate. I'm just, like, hauling at Mach 10. She's just like, is that a blight? Is that a blight? <laughs> Sadly, we won't be able to tell because we'd have to swap one of the mini debris we needed. Isn't that right there? Someone's over there. Beautiful, let's fucking go. And yeah, doesn't fucking matter. She has no shack pallet. We have four stacks of coup. <laughs> she was running basement anyways. Oh man. Hey, they got all their gens done at least. I'm just gonna hook back. We're not gonna let them have a chance at this. <laughs> She's on Deathhook anyways. I don't know why I thought she'd have adrenaline and she went on Deathhook. I want actually tracking hooks fully. But GG's though. So. Hey, Skies, how are you doing? She's giving you so many... She gave me so many stacks. Why? I, I, this That's gonna be a good video. I'll end up talking about how that worked out so well. We had another similar match on a different map that played out very similarly. I'll be able to talk about that. We, we might, uh, macroed our uh, play with food stacks so incredibly well. I don't care if she gets out. We got our own uh, three game. You need the microwave to answer. GG's. Ooh, no pre drop. That's 4k, but we'll give him game. I knew this to Biffle, yep! Yeah? And play with your food, don't forget that. Hey. <laughs> Go on. And we had, we had to Biffle and play with your food. I kept running into Nia, I think I got like 7-8 stacks that game or some sh- Agreed, Evan. How are you doing, by the way, Evan? Good to see you. I'm gonna say GG won't play to these gamers. <laughs> so just like the last match this was another round where play with your food not only provided some protection for our save the best for last in the event that we needed it but it also gave us some extra lethality that was necessary in order to create the snowball potential necessary for us to win the game as early as we did. It not only prevented us from entering a prob problematic stage of the late game that it would have been very hard for us to salvage, but we were also able to get some survivors earlier out of the match and push, pull them off of gens. You know, Rotten Fields is a pretty good map, I would say, for Clown. It doesn't have entirely too many strong tiles, there's a very strong pallet with the uh, hay bales and the tractor early in. That's probably the strongest pallet next to cow tree on the map. I guess that in Kill Shack. Um, and what that means is that when you have all of this extra lethality loaded into your perks on a map like this, you are able to have incredibly fast chases that the survivors, if they aren't playing at peak performance with strong and metal loadouts themselves, they're not going to be able to keep up with you. 
you know, that is something that we see here. And, you know, we're going to be also, just like in the last match, we'll be talking about it there. But first things first, let's kind of get started talking about the perks that the survivors were running this match. So the Obsession, the Nia, she had Sprint Burst, Reassurance, Adrenaline, and Clairvoyance. Both the Sprint Burst and even the Reassurance alone, that kind of plays into our playstyle. Because we are not intending to actually commit toward a full chase with the Nia. Maybe we take a free health state, which we do at some point later in the game. But for the most part, we're not actually trying to really chase her. You know, we want to initiate the chase, or as I like to call it, manipulate the chase mechanics. But we're not actually looking to chase her. Similarly, the reassurance. You know, we are not really expecting to have to deal with that as an issue because... We're not camping out our hooks to the full second state. We are taking advantage of survivors on the hook, almost as if they're bait, you could say. And we are playing around that with respect to who comes for the save. Especially when you consider that it's rotten fields, a lot of the hooks are going to be very dangerous. They're not going to be in proximity to any type of strong pallets, especially if they do get kicked early. You know, there might just be one pallet for probably four to five tiles, and so that doesn't really leave survivors a lot to work with, you know, coming off of the hook. And so when it comes to something like reassurance, reassurance isn't really going to be a problem for us. We're not looking to actually play off of the hook states themselves. We are looking to just get fast, strong chases. All right. So anyways, that's the Nia's. Talita had distortion. And I've always talked about distortion and made for this. You know, when, when you have a survivor like this, these are the survivors you typically try to ignore. You aren't really going to do very well. Now, Rotten Fields is a little bit different. You know, the, the, like I said, there aren't a lot of strong tiles. But a survivor with this type of loadout, you aren't going to want to put pressure on because not only will they have that good injured chase, which especially early game, when you haven't built up your save the best for last stacks, if you don't have any stacks to play with your food, you know, your rapid brutality on that very limited timer, and you know, you're not going to have any coup stacks if it's the first chase, a loadout like what this Talita has is going to cause you problems. You don't typically want to chase these survivors, right, unless it's completely free. So next would be the Nancy. Nancy is, this is, by comparison, this is who you would want to chase. Because she has Adrenaline, that does nothing early game. Hope does nothing early game. Quick and Quiet can do something with head-on, you know, but without any type of R protection, especially with our cigar box, we would see her if she tries to do it mid-chase in a tile, you know, when there's not line of sight. We would see when it happens. And if we have the speed to catch up and pull her out of that locker before head-on is active, then she's just basically giving herself up. There is a short window, I believe it's about three seconds, when a survivor enters a locker before head-on is actually active. And given that we move faster with our bottles, you know, we have a much better chance at catching her while she is, you know, while head-on is not able to stun us. And we never even had that to begin with, but it's just something to point out. She has, by comparison, the weakest link when it comes to any type of build. You know, even the obsession with us not wanting to hit the obsession, that sprint burst alone is enough of a deterrence to make committing to a chase very, you know, difficult, right? We need to uh, have strong chases, and if it was someone else besides the obsession who had that, you know, say the Nancy, that could have been a problem for us. Lastly, the last person was the Dwight. Now, Dwight had also a very similar build to the Toledo, and it's in that same manner. Hell, his is actually worse. You don't want to be chasing someone like this Dwight unless it's completely free. He has resilience made for this and distortion. Not only does this mean that you can't play to the optimal set of your, uh, your, you know, your performance using your, your bottles because you can't use your yellow bottles, but you're also just not going to be able, unless you play completely perfectly, even if you do get the read, you play around the fact you don't have scratch marks, you play around the fact you don't see the R's, even if you put your yellow and your pink bottle right, you have to read into that without failing a mind game and still catch them off of prediction before they make it to a pallet or a window against made for this plus resilience. Together, that does get a little bit more dicey, you know, and it's, it's the biggest part about what makes distortion so hard to commit to a survivor is the scratch marks, okay? Not being able to see the R's is one thing, 
<clears throat> it's something that you could deal with as a clown player on its own. But when you can't even see scratch marks in addition to ours, you are now playing the chase against a distortion survivor at a suboptimal standard. You are not playing at a level where you are reasonably expected to get the down. Because in any high wall tile, this is this is just, I think, a matter of principle. And I think a lot of extremely high level, we're talking uh, you know, competitive level survivors would agree with me. If you are playing at a very high level as a survivor, and you know the killer can't see your scratch marks, and you know that the killer can't see your aura, and you have breaking of line of sight, you understand check spots, you know how to play certain angles, you should confidently be able to win a chase against Cloud. Yellow or pink aside, especially if you have knowledge about how he plans on using those bottles at a very, very high level, you will not be able to get hit by the clown. It's it's literally on you. I want to make that very clear because if clown can't see ours, can't see scratch marks, all he's got are blood, all he's got are sound, he's got no line of sight, that is literally on you for getting hit. That is what makes it so rough, especially when you've got made for this and resilience to make the animations faster, to give you that extra window of time where you would otherwise get hit, converting it into a last second save, and by extension of how the game itself works, that save itself adding 15, 20 plus seconds extra time. You know, because there are different ways that that could happen. What happens if you expend the last of your bottles as clown? You know, we're running a four bottle economy. We expend the last of our bottles going for a hit, made for this plus resilience, getting that person to save because we don't see the scratch marks. We don't see the auras and they make it to that pallet. We now have to reload. They're able to chain from that. Do you really see how problematic it can be? That's really what I mean, and that's why I'm spending all this time right now bringing it down for you guys. That's why, you know, I give the advice I do with respect to that and how that can really influence and how that should influence your decisions with respect to what chases you decide to take. Okay, so now we've kind of talked about the map itself. We've talked about the perks the survivors are running. Now what we're going to do, just like the last match, we are going to look at the game itself. I'm going to be playing it at a faster speed without sound, and we're going to be talking about it, gang. We're going to be talking about everything that transpired here. Give me just a sec, please, gang. Alrighty. So to start things off, we're loading in. We're on the south side of the map, or what I would call the south side at least. We start running toward this side. We are just looking for someone. We know, basically, again, for those that don't know, there there is a set of properties that define where survivors spawn. Survivors cannot spawn in a certain radius around you from where you are. So I know I didn't have to worry about so much that back half of the map. Let's go ahead and go back to the uh, beginning here as we're coming here. I don't have to worry about anyone on this right side from where I am, my right side. So that's why I go left. I start going left. I expect this is where I'm going to find survivors. And sure enough, gang... I find not one, but I find two. And there's a moment I call out, is this the Nia? This is the Nia. I know it's the Nia. I mentioned this just like I said in the Ormond game. You know, uh, gang, this is this is based off cosmetics. This is based off of knowing what they kind of look like. And I know because Nia has the beanie. This is the Nia. Nia's the obsession. I checked for that preemptively. I'm purposefully going for this just to start that chase mechanic, the manipulation. We get our stack. We are now moving 5% faster going toward this Dwight. This is essentially the same thing as if we had Rapid Brutality committing toward this first health state, which is a big deal. Think about how influential Rapid Brutality can be when you're going for that second health state. We have that for the first health state. So we go for our pink. What I'm trying to do here is initially I threw a yellow trying to see if he would go into the yellow so we could hit him, pick up the yellow, converge, and then throw a pink. He kind of played very smart. He got away from both bottles. And this, we threw this other yellow again for that reason. I'm trying to get him as he's going into it. Notice he spins, doubles back. He knows what I'm doing. He knows that I'm placing. This is actually a very smart player. He knows I'm trying to set things up. It's one of two things I should actually clarify. Either he knows I'm literally setting this shit up because he's looking at my bottles. He sees I'm throwing yellows and not pinks. And he knows I'm going to capitalize off the yellow to catch him. Or he assumes they're pinks and he's preemptively dodging just bottle placements because he assumes that I'm trying to slow him down. It's one of those two factors. But ultimately, ultimately, we are displacing him from our own bottles in general. 
and by displacing him from our bottles, we are displacing ourselves from our yellow bottles, which means we can't synergize our yellow bottles with our rapid brutality to converge for the second health state. So that's what we do. We get this first hit, but you see how he's going combine? I actually don't want to chase this. This is why I pull away, because I have zero bottles. We are very early into the game. I've already walked by th uh, two survivors. I know there's going to be other survivors working on a gen. I just get this feeling that it's not smart to commit to this, and especially since I know how much progress was being worked on this gen. You know, we heard it as we walked by. I just felt we just take our one Stabiffle stack. We see it as an, a slight increase to our momentum, and we start to just try to chase someone else. So we break away from the Dwight, we leave him injured, we come this way, we push her off this gin. That's a big deal. You know, this gin has some progress. We get this hit, we realize don't commit. This gin has some decent progress. It has about two pistons from the looks of it almost. By pushing Toledo off, we are uh, keeping that at that 50% progress. We are pushing her to a strong tile. We don't have any bottles, but that's okay. Dwight's away. Dwight's either going to be working on a gin while injured, which would be very risky. He could be doing that. Or someone's healing him, which means they're not doing gins, and he's not doing gins, and that's stalling them while I chase a third person. All right, that leaves only one person at most doing gins. So even without any gin perks, any types of slowdown, the gins are not going to be going nearly as fast right now as if I chose to chase the Dwight. Because what would have happened if I chose to chase the Dwight gang? Let's go back. We're coming over here. Uh, we chase the Dwight here. Let's let's talk about this real quick. This is very important. Remember, she's working on this gin as we do this. If I get this hit, and I start going this way, and I don't have any bottles, you know, I don't have any bottles, we're coming back this way, I get this hit. If I commit to this without any bottles, here's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to push him onto the tractor. I'm going to have to slice him as best as I can, give him the possibility that he can still go off this right side. Do you see the right side? He could take that to chain into that jungle gym, rotate even further right, okay? Because remember, I don't have any bottles, right? So I would have to do this reload on the tractor think about how long i got to reload then what i would have to do is throw my bottles as i reposition and hope that i'm able to catch them on the tractor and hope that i don't mess up my lunges mess up my bottle placements or even mess up the movement as i rotate around the tractor because sometimes you know coming around that right side you can fall a bit you can stutter and a single stutter when you commit let's say one even two bottles with a four bottle economy, with zero gen perks, on commission of how I said, with the understanding that these other survivors are doing generators in the background, that throws you your game. That is GG's. To commit to this Dwight in this manner without any bottles, not only is it risky again in of itself due to how I have to position myself first before I reload and then play perfectly, this shit has to come out very fast. It has to come out extremely fast and it has to be a very smart hook and, you know, like, I, I have to somehow afterward do crazy as well, because it's not like the other survivors aren't doing anything, and I don't have a whole lot of Stabiffle stacks yet. I'm, at the moment, would be playing without any Pwiff stacks. I would be running with a couple, uh, you know, Coup de Gras stacks, but if, if the other survivors are playing smart still, because they've had all the time to rotate and everything, then... I'm still not really in a very good position. I would argue I'm still in a worse position than if I just did what I did and I had to break the chase early because he's still going to be injured. He's still going to be displaced. But the Toledo is no longer going to be working on the gens. The Nancy is going to be pushed away from that gen. She's also likely not going to be working on it. Whatever gen she is going to be working on is likely to have less progress. Hell, she may even, because we saw it was, a, I believe, a silver glyph, she, she might be focused on the glyph. She might not have even been doing gen. She, her, her next goal might be picking up that glyph, going to the basement. All right, gang? All of these are things you need to take into account when it comes to understanding this game. So that is why I didn't do it. Because again, again, what happens if I fucked up? What happens if I didn't hit him? I lose the game. So that's why we didn't do it. So we let him go. We push Toledo off this gen. We pull her to this pallet. This pallet's insane. This pallet is insane. And this is her confidence that is why she doesn't drop this pallet. Her confidence is why. Because we are able to get this yellow here. And she should not get back to this pallet. If we come through with this yellow, we rotate. Do you know why? Again, this is what I talked about in the last match with when it comes to certain movements. 
we put the yellow and we rotate even though we don't have an intention of actually committing because we are trying to push her further inward so she is further away from the outside. This means if she wants to play the specific tile that she intentionally greeted without pre-dropping, she is going to open herself up to a vulnerable position from my yellow plus my pink, or she has to chain to the right into this jungle gym, okay? But I still have three bottles, you know? Well, rather, I would now have two. I would have one. Okay, excuse me. I would have to likely do the yellow and reload, but I would still be in a better position even if she chained after reloading because I would keep her away from these gins. I would keep Nancy, because we see how she's in this area, I would keep Nancy away from that gin, the one with at least two pistons of progress. And after reloading, I could much easily, it would be much more easier to play this jungle gin palette pre-dropped than it would be to play this one back here. This palette is probably the strongest palette on this map. Rotten Fields again, it's pretty good for clown, but this palette is absurd. I purposefully let her finish the glyph out of kindness. You know, this is basically a free health state anyways, right? Like, there's, there's no point in, in my opinion, just a, a quick, like, mention, like, just not letting them do it. Let them do it. Get the hit. You know what I mean? She tried to stand side me. She probably, paused. she probably didn't think that I would be able to see that I, you know, she was on top of me and I didn't know where she went, but I did. And, you know, due to our, uh, our recovery, we were able to catch her. So this is a quick hook. This is really, really good for us. We were kind of playing around the fact that she probably didn't think that we were going to rush right to her. We were playing off of the momentum here. Because remember, um, remember going back to this, this is kind of important to mention. I'm doing multiple things at once. I'm not just solely focused on the Toledo. I am looking around me. You know, I am seeing what's going on, like, in my immediate presence. So we get our yellow set up. You know, I come around for this pink. And as I'm doing that, I, I, I didn't entirely see the Nancy right there. A big part of it really was I heard her. I, I saw the scream, I do kind of see this, and I see the glyph, and I see that she's working on it, and I'm like, okay, sweet, this is this is great. This is great. The Talit is already giving me a rough time. Can, j just choosing not to go for this Nancy when she's offering herself up to me, essentially, for that free hit, with this how strong this palette was, is a very, very damn risky choice. I probably still could have hit her, but it would have still been one hit. She could have still, like I said, chained to any one of these tiles, and... I would be giving up the opportunity of that free health state and even as we saw the free down because again we are running no corrupt intervention we are running no deadlock we are very early into the game we have not ramped ourselves up yet we have not built up save the best for last stacks we have not we do not have any coup de grace stacks for our chases if we really do need that extra lethality this is literally where we need our first hooks to come right now we need them to come very quickly so you know again i'm setting up playing around the Toledo. Out of kindness, I let her finish, and I get my first hit. This is a regular chase at this point. Once I let it finish, I, I see that as you give me the free hit, but this is a regular chase, you know what I mean? So she, I, I treat this as her trying to avoid me seeing where she's going. I get the second hit. That's my first hook. That's my first hook. We take her to our hook here. All righty. And from here, the next stage, we kick this gen. This was the important gen I was talking about. This is good because at this point, we've already pushed everyone away from this side of the map. Think about how much time has transpired. Remember, Dwight was taking us to this area to begin with until we hit him. Then he went to the opposite direction. Toledo and Nancy were both on this side of the map until as we were going around from Toledo, we broke away. We pushed away into the Nancy. Toledo left the side of the map. Toledo's, I'm almost very confident, is not here. It's not like she, I don't think she was looking to, to hide at this gen, to my understanding. She didn't finish this gen very early. Talita's not here anymore. So if Dwight's not here, if Talita's not here, if we haven't seen Nia here at all, the only person otherwise here, you know, is the Nancy. We hook the Nancy. We can afford to kick this gen. And this gen is going to give us some regression. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do that. But more than just giving us the regression, it commands them to come to the side of the map for two reasons now instead of one. They can't just let her cook. If they let her cook for most of her hook state, then we're gonna get a lot of regression off of that gen. Because again, I'm not playing off of her hitting second hook state. I am playing off of very quick chases. I am playing off of ramping myself up and being able to put these survivors in a position where they can't keep up with my momentum. That's the idea behind the build, gang. You ramp up your momentum and your lethality, the survivors aren't able to now keep up with the pressure. It doesn't matter that we don't have deadlock corrupt or any types of gin slowdown. Our, our chase lethality is so damn good 
it's beyond the survivor's ability to keep up. So we get the hook, we kick the gen, we start going this way. I know that they were likely in this area because we saw how we pushed them. We see Dwight, Dwight's injured. He's working on this gen, it's got some progress. This is a big deal what's about to happen right now. This pallet goes down. Remember, we're still at five gens. I don't care that he's getting uh, that he's going away. I, I don't even care. Why do I care about what just happened right now? This is literally the strongest pallet in this in this section of the map. This this pallet right here. Because this gen needs to get done. This gen has not been done yet. And this is the only pallet they've got for protection. Given that Shaq itself is isolated from everything, and how individually the only thing it's got going for it is the pre-drop factor, once this pallet is gone, this is a dead zone. This is a massive unsafe dead zone. Because you're going to see in just a minute, there are going to be a couple chases that come back to this kill shack. They don't have the pallet to rely on. What do they have? The window. It's not enough. So we kick this pallet, we leave, we kick this gen. Because again, what does kicking this gen do? It pulls them, it forces them back over here. But we kick this pallet. This is now a dead zone. They want to come back over here as we're starting to ramp up our lethality. Good. That's going to be very quick chases for us. So she's still chilling on the hook. We're coming around this way. Why are we coming this way? Dwight went through the shack. All right, let's go back. We kick this. Look where he's going. Do you see how he went to the right? Dwight is on the uh, the other side of the map, likely with Talita, potentially, likely with the, um, with the Nia, because we know the Nia, as we see, was spent a lot of time over there. I can afford to rotate this way with the understanding that Anyone else is going to be on the other side. So we're going to come and check this gen. We're coming to see if we find anybody. We don't see anybody. We don't hear anybody. And the unhook happens. So I rotate back. Remember, I have that yellow. The idea behind this yellow, this is an initiation yellow. I'm not using this yellow for mobility. Notice how I throw the yellow very close to the gen. I'm using this yellow with the understanding that if someone was here, if they rotated to another pallet, I could with makeup kit maintain the momentum possibly without needing another yellow, and I could set up a double bottle combo, catch them around a pre-drop pallet, okay? That's the idea behind that yellow there, but the unhook happens, we don't see any body, and instead I'm able to take that yellow and I come back to the hook with it. Remember, look how long it lasts, we've got a lot of time. Now I did not want to play around pallet possession, gang. This is what I did. Remember, she's got base kit endurance, gang. I could have lunged in and hit it, but, oh no, the gen popped. Right, the gen popped just now, right before. I didn't want to use my coup stacks here. I was really, really nervous because, again, we don't have a whole lot of pressure. We only have one hook. We have two injuries, but only one of those injuries is the person nearby because we have the Talita, who has both, again, I believe she has made for this, and distortion. So I was very nervous about cooing into this Nancy. Because that's a strong pallet. We respect the pallet possession. We give it to her. We instead go for the Toledo. And we are able... Well, I would have been able to get this hit. I even remark on it. That's on me. That was on me. Because I didn't entirely respect um, her understanding of what to do and how to change it, chain it. As well as the pallet also how close it was when it was pre-dropped. That was on me. We get this yellow. And I am, I am actually planning to play this pre-drop, believe it or not. This is literally me attempting to get this hidden pre-drop in this exact moment. But as I start to rotate back, I change my mind. Because I am looking at the state of the game right now. I don't have Rapid Brutality active. I don't have Play With Your Food active. I'm seeing the shape. Do you see the tractor? Do you see how long the tractors go with the boxes and the hay bales? I'm telling myself... My chances of playing this are not going to be possible at the moment with zero bottles. I would have to engineer a perfectly constructed YP-YP combo. Yellow bottle, pink bottle, yellow bottle, pink bottle as I consistently rotate in a smart manner. And then catch her with the, with the coup de gras. And I would have to do that perfectly in order to hit her around that pallet. Or, or what I could do is I could kick this pallet right here. As she's still on this left side, getting ready at worst to rotate this way. And worst case scenario is we push into this jungle gym in front of me. I could shift to the right side of it to push her into the corner, reload my bottles, and then set up a double bottle combo around the pre-drop pallet. That's what I could do. And that's what I was expecting to have to do in the worst case scenario. But instead, when we kick this pallet, See, she goes through my pink. 
I'm telling you right now, she has been analyzing how I've been playing. She did not expect me to kick this pallet. In the same way that I said I actually was attempting to play this pre-drop, she was expecting me to play this pre-drop. And she didn't have full line of sight on me kicking this pallet. So when I kicked this pallet and she turned to see it and she was intoxicated, that's why she's running into this wall. I caught her ass off guard. She did not expect it. And that's how we get this hit. Look at this. She boxes herself because I literally just made her brain short circuit. She didn't see that shit coming. We're able to get this hit. And she's going toward the pallet. But look. This pallet right here, I try to get her with the coup because we're going so fast. It's still a rapid brutality. I don't make it. But look, she's boxed in. This is what I was talking about like I wanted to do at the other jungle gym tile. Except this one's even better for us. You know, th the reason why, again, I'm rotating this way and I'm sp specifically facing this way, I don't want her getting back here. I know that especially with how close she is this way, she can't get to the right just yet. So we come back, we throw the yellow because I know she's coming this way. I face this way. Specifically, I want her to look at my yellow, look at where I'm looks like I'm going to push her somewhat into it because, again, I threw this yellow with the understanding she's not going to get it if I play it properly. So we throw the yellow. We come around, fake the pallet kick. She's going toward it. Do y'all see this? Look at this. I throw the, I reload. Come back away, fake the movement, throw the yellow specifically between the pallet on the right side of that other bale so it's on that so I can rotate into it. And she's going into it. She sees this, and I know this is a smart player. She thinks she can get this yellow. And when you are playing at a very high level, this is something you can do. You engineer misconceptions about distance that survivors have on timer that it takes for these bottles to activate, and the ability for them to safely get your yellow bottles, make it somewhere, or even just avoid the hit. Okay? So she's going for it, but that's the thing, gang. We Look, it's not even active yet. As we start to rotate... She notices that, look at this, she's not able to get anywhere now. She can't go right because the pallet's right there. And look where the pink is. Look where the pink is. She can't avoid the pink. She didn't get the yellow, by the way. We just barely, this was a tight one because she played it really well. We just barely not only pushed her out of the yellow so she couldn't get the yellow and avoid the effects of her pink intoxication. Because again, for those that don't know, your pink intoxication can be negated by a yellow bottle if you misplace it and a survivor gets invigorated. So not only did we get her to, uh, we managed to uh, have her avoid our yellow bottles, we were able to push her through our pink bottles. She could not get anywhere. Why is she running into this shit? She's intoxicated as well. She can't see. She is not invigorated. She is intoxicated. She missed our yellow. She couldn't get to the pallet. She's in a dead zone. She can't get anywhere. That's a down, gang. Perfect bottle placement. So we get this down, generator just pops, that's fine, that's Q-Stacks, gang. That's extra momentum. We take this hook, we lose a gen, but two survivors are injured, but one just healed. That's fine. We get our yellow, we start looking. I know this gen's likely being worked on because survivors have been on this side of the map. We come over to this gen. I don't really see anybody, so I leave. We come check this side. I thought someone was going to be there at least. We don't see anybody, so we come check this way. And we see Dwight. We see Dwight. So we want to get this hit right here. Remember, there's no Kill Shack pallet. Remember, he dropped Kill Shack earlier. That's what's so good for us. Notice how he's literally, he kind of ran in a circle, realized there is nothing he can do. Because there is nothing he can do. What he could do is Kill Shack if he didn't drop the pallet. But it's gone. It was dropped at five gens extremely early. He's got this pallet, which is okay. It's kind of, it's like okay at best. But with our speed differential, our recovery from Save the Best for Last, with our speed from Rapid Brutality, even though we have zero bottles, we're able to beat him. We didn't even need Coup to down him before he got to the pallet, but I specifically cooed, as I said, because I want to keep him from this pallet. I want to keep him from any type of potential blind spot. You know what I mean? I want to be able to ensure that I get this hook as cleanly as possible because we still have two stacks of Coup de Gras. We still have Coup stacks. And we get this kick, and in addition to getting this kick, Nia is now working on this gen. This is a big deal. This is where our farming starts to come in, because we're carrying Dwight. We see a Nia here. We start the chase through chase manipulation without even trying to chase her because of her proximity. And we gain a free stack to play with her food with just by wanting to hook the Dwight. We're hooking him next to this gen for that reason, too, and kicking it. Because Nia is the one putting pressure on this gen. It's not the Nancy... It's not the Toledo, it's the Nia, okay? 
So what that means is that even if I'm not playing for extra hook states, if I'm not trying to get second state on the Dwight, I can punish this Nia for the time that she spent working on this gen by kicking it after hooking nearby because she is likely going to be the one coming back to that area, which means that as long as I keep manipulating the chases, I can keep getting play with your food stacks without any effort. You know, she's got cow tree to her left. She's got another pallet to her right, but that's not going to stop her from initiating chase for me because we're not actually trying to hit her to begin with. You know, we're just trying to get the line of sight, start the chase. And then we kick the gen to pull her back and we rinse and repeat the process, gang. So we start a chase again. We get our second stack. You know, that's kind of why we start coming over here. What is it that I mentioned earlier, gang? You hit two stacks. You want to start looking to down somebody else. So I start coming over here. I get my yellow because I'm ready to initiate. This yellow is not from ability. This yellow is in case someone's here. I'm ready to play the LT. I'm going to put this yellow here. And if someone's here, I would put the pink on the other side of that LT, on the right side of that, you know, of the wall. And then I would rotate, push through it. And with coup, two stacks of play with your food, you know, no matter how I rotate or splice it, you're getting hit. I'm then going to recover with my eight stacks now, save the best for last. I'll still have brutality. I'll have one stack of play with your food, and I'll still have a stack of coup, even if I have to coup to begin with because I have two stacks going into it. That's a quick hook. And if that hook is quick enough, then we would be able to get back to the survivor before they get unhooked as well. And I would be able to snowball so hard off of that because one survivor has to unhook that survivor. That's two. The third person makes three, which means a fourth person would now have to do something, which means nobody's doing gens. We are artificially now would be creating so much generator slowdown by virtue of our lethality without any perks to influence it because our chases would just be so damn fast. All right. So anyways, we start looking. We don't see anybody. We aren't able to initiate off of that yellow into a pink for a chase. And then we find the, uh, find the Nancy. We are able to now do something here. Our makeup kit especially means that we don't need to worry about setting up with a yellow going to this palette. And the way that she's moving, do you see how she's looking? Do you see how she's moving? I could guarantee it. She, uh, guarantee it. She does not understand how fast we move and how much I can slow her down. Her idea is that based on when she saw me and as she's starting to go to this palette, that she is going to be able to vault this pallet. I'm not going to have enough time to rotate around it. And she's going to be able to potentially, uh, at, at worst, make it here before I can hit her. She thinks she's going to be able to force me to kick this pallet. But that's the thing, gang. That is very damn far from the truth. And y'all are about, and you know, as y'all saw previously, and y'all are about to see again, that's what happens. We purposefully throw the pink onto the pallet because we know she's going to vault it. And we get that hit clean. She doesn't even make it, y'all, to the other side of the bale. That's how quickly we are moving. We are literally moving so quick with our yellow, and especially how we slowed her. She didn't even make it to the other side of the bale. This forces her back. And because we force her back, her speed boost from getting injured will have already expired by the time she vaults, and she will be refreshing the duration of the pink intoxication, slowing her down again even further. Which means, again, because it's rotten fields, y'all, she goes nowhere. She's got nowhere she could go. Even if she wanted to go to this jungle gym to the right, she wouldn't be able to make that. So we start going around. We, we do ring around the rosy because <laughs> she's got nothing she can do. You know, it's the best she can stall. And, and, and that's a hook, gang. That's a hook. That's us playing around this Nia. Again, we're going to briefly go back and look at this. Remember, we hook. We get this kick. This is to pull, them, uh, pull the Nia back over here. And we are at one stack. And we just, we just play around this. We play around how we know this is the area she's put pressure on. And we are able to gain this extra lethality so we can go away from that side of the map. We can take our lethality and play off of it. Don't see anybody here. That's fine. That's fine. We don't really mind that because we see the Nancy. And we know that we are just going to be able to get this super damn fast chase. She's got literally nothing going for her on the side of the map. Get the down here. Put her on the hook. Dwight is now fully healed, but we're good for our next chase. We're good for our next chase because we have eight stacks of Save the Best for Last. We have two stacks of coup, which means I can use coup de gras off of an, uh, an, a healthy survivor if I need to. But instead, because I know the Nia's on this side of the map, what do I do first? Because I know that I have the pressure of someone previously on the hook on the other side of the map, isolated from the other survivors that are all on this side of the map. What is it that I do? I ignore 
um, the person to my right. I go for the Nia. I'm not trying to chase her. She's going to cow tree. Why? So I can do the same thing I mentioned. We kick this gen. Doesn't have a lot of progress. In fact, y'all saw how much it regressed? It, it's now down to like half a piston. You know, she has not been able to come back. We have undone a lot of her pressure. And I guarantee you that is something that has really made her think she now needs to work a lot harder. She sees how much I've done just by sheer base regression. And with how many hooks I'm now starting to generate at this point in the game, that's making her nervous, I think. And that's why you're going to see us get a lot of stacks upcoming for this next stage of the match. So we throw a yellow. We start coming back this way because we know she's here. Because look, she really wants to get back. She thinks I'm leaving. And she really wants to get back on that gen gang. Because she knows that she needs to get some gens done. And she has seen how much pressure we have put on it. You know, she knows we haven't hit her. That is the one thing that she's banking on. She is banking on the fact that we are not actually hooking her. We are. She is keeping us the way she sees it. She is keeping us preoccupied. That is her perception of what she's doing right now. But that is not actually what's going on. We are deceiving her perception of things because she, again, you know, she mentioned this in the post game, y'all. She mentioned it in the post game. She did not know we had play with your food. Her idea with what's going on right now is she is preoccupying us. She thinks this is free pressure for her, but it is literally the opposite. Because again, we are now back up to two stacks. We come back this way. And look who we're chasing. We hit Dwight. Because like I said, when I when I hit two stacks, play with your feud gang, uh, that's a full health chase. You know, I, I'm willing to chase just about damn near anybody when I hit two stacks, play with your food. Especially if I have coup. If I have, let's say, four, four at the bare minimum, right? If you are definitely at six to eight stacks of uh, save the best for last, and you have two stacks of coup de gras, and you have two stacks to play with your food. You can literally chase damn near anybody on the map, and it is going to be a smart chase. Especially if they're in a bad location, right? Just like this Dwight was. He's trying to heal on the hook. He does not know how fast we are moving to, uh, to go rotate over to him. He does not anticipate how quickly I'm going to be able to catch up to him after that first health state as he's going back to kill Shaq. So we hit him as he is healing the person off the hook. And look, look at how far he is before we were already chasing him. I put this pink for that reason. He doesn't even make it to the doorway, gang. Like, he just barely gets it. And, and the only reason he makes it to the doorway is because we didn't coup. Because I'm playing efficient with my stacks. He, he is not even damn near close to this window. Even if the pallet was up, he wouldn't even be close to that. You know, this is a very weak part of the map now, ever since he dropped that pallet. Even though he couldn't make it, it is, this is now deceptively very weak for the survivors that is our first instance of downing somebody because of that and we do the same thing again gang the same thing that i talked about we get our hook at a very strong point of the map for us because who's putting pressure on this side of the map the nia we rotate around boom that's five percent we kick the gen again see look she's just now about to break one piston y'all she put so much work into it in the past so much work and she was about to break one piston again we rotate back after the hook. We gain a stack of play with their food. We kick the gen again. This commands her again to rotate back. But that's the thing. She is she is desperately doing what she can to play smart for her team. That's why she hasn't immediately rotated back. She starts to rotate back, if anything, because she sees me doing this to unhook the Dwight. But she sees me coming. She sees how aggressively I'm playing. And she doesn't unhook. She doesn't unhook. And I think that's for two reasons. One, she has reassurance. You can, she can buy a lot of time on the hook for the Dwight, given that he is on second stage, just by reassurancing, breaking from the tile, because she doesn't expect me to actually camp this out. I have not played in that manner that aggressively on camping so far, and she knows that that's going to be very smart, given that she has it, to go ahead and just pop the reassurance, break from the tile. But the other thing, too, is that if... If by virtue of her doing this, this is going to pull me, this, this, she, she knows that I'm going to be committing toward her, okay? That is basically what it's about. She, oh, and it's also because I'm going to tunnel. See, if, if she were to unhook, that's what I meant to say, excuse me. If she were to unhook, let's go back. Again, if she, if she were to unhook over here, instead of pop reassurance, then what would happen is I could just tunnel this swipe. She was afraid with how aggressive I was playing, there was also the potential I could tunnel the Dwight off the hook. And that would have been a really big problem. Instead, we 
we because of the fact that he uh, she has reassurance again we are not playing for Dwight hitting second stage that is not with this build we are looking for the fast chases chasing this Neo like this with Dwight on the hook means Toledo or Nancy have to get off of Jens to also get off uh, pull Dwight off the hook and if they are doing that in the whole time in the background that Jen that I kicked that had all that progress it's regressing which means they may have to go do go and tap that gen. But that's in the corner of the map. That can be set up all, uh, I can set up off of that with my yellow and my pinks, with stacks of play with your food, with coup de gras, with the recovery from save the best for last. Everything has engineered itself like this, gang. This is all the strength of the lethality of this build really, really coming into motion, y'all. No pun intended. And so we chase her, we get our we get our second stack. I come to check this gen. I don't see anybody. I come to check this gen. And we catch Talita. You know, look at this. I get this hit. Y'all, she goes through my yellow. This is a yellow, by the way. And remember, she is made for this. This is yellow made for this. Look at this. Look how look how much distance she already has. There's no pallet. She couldn't go pallet if she wanted to. What does she do? She goes window. She is sped up by made for this. She is sped up by my yellow bottle. But we have uh, rapid brutality plus play with your food, which is essentially the same thing as having two stacks of play with your food. That, and as a result as well from our recovery from Save the Best for Last, means with our coup de gras, she does not make it over this window, even with a fast fault. Look at this. We just barely hit her. Remember, we're throwing this yellow. We're setting up off this yellow. Notice the yellow is right on the gen. I get this hit while sped up. Even though she gets it, I get it again. I refresh. And... She is not able to make the window. We just get the, the fast, you know, the, the cube over the fast fault. And who is it that was right here, right as that happened? See, she, here's the dynamics behind this. Here's why this was so important. If she, if I was not able to hit Talita before she made it to this window, that's 20 to 30 seconds on this chase because these two people would have rotated. See how Nancy and the Dwight are healing under hook? Talita could have gone to that pallet that's behind them. They could have start to rotate to the other side of the map as I come around the right side to leave the kill shack. I would also have to recover from missing my M1. And I would be on the downturn when it comes to momentum. I would have to almost consider breaking chase, but who am I going to go for, right? Who am I going to go for if the Dwight and the Nancy start to pre-run? You know, I would likely have to commit to the Talita, who is now either going to be at this pallet, or hell, she rotates to kill shack, or excuse me, not kill shack, cow tree. She could rotate maybe even a cow tree. You know what I mean, gang? It's 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 such a big deal that we did hit her like this. It's such a big deal. Because that means that when we down her over this window, we can play off of this unhook and their greed to heal on the hook and snowball so hard. So we get this down here. I purposefully don't pick up because I know they're healing on the hook. Dried has distortion. His base kit BT expires and he has no anti-tunnel. And the reason why I don't pick up Dwight, even though Dwight is on death hook, is because I know Talita has the most recovery progress, and I know the hook is literally right here. I figure I should have time for this. There's no pallet he can crawl under, and I should be able to get back and then hook him afterwards. So we get a free hook from the Talita, putting her on second, and we take Dwight out of the match. That's how strong it was that we got that coup with the yellow, with our play with your food, and the rapid brutality and our save the best for last recovery. It's just so much lethality, gang. And then we start to, again, again, gang. It, it, it's like it's like a broken record, you know? What happens again? Nia's on that same gen, trying to get this gen done. We kick it. It's now at three pistons. How many pistons have been lost and gained, y'all, on this one single gen as a result of this Nia? A shit ton. We pick up a stack of play with your food. We now kick this pallet. Now that we've eliminated a survivor from the match, we can afford to start being a little bit more gratuitous in trading in some of our stacks here for some extra lethality. Now, I don't hit her just, just yet. I play around the cooldown and pick up my second stack of play with your food. And again, she's not playing around me having play with your food. She's trying to do something at this point, maybe even try to body block and cancel my save the best for last. But when she sees how far I'm running away from her, she starts to realize that the idea of just following me to remove save the best for last acts is not going to do anything. Even though she can't really, she doesn't know to play around and play with your food, she realizes she can't do anything with how much distance around save the best for last. And again, 
We're now coming off a of cooldown. Do you see the timer on? Play with your food. It's coming off cooldown. We initiate the chase. We manipulate it to start it by looking through the window because we have line of sight on her and she is running away from us. That does trigger the start of a chase, which means we can get our third stack of play with your food. And we use that going into our next chase. You know, we play around this. This is something that with practice, it becomes a lot easier to engineer. And this gen pops, this tells me someone's here. And you're going to see, notice how she stops moving. This Nancy just like basically accepted it. She accepted her fate almost for this hit because we are moving at 140% movement speed right now. We have three stacks of play with your food, which puts us at 130 with our base movement speed. And we have 10% from our yellow bottle. This is, this is a 40% difference in speed between me and her. And we are coming so fast, she knows she can't do anything. We get this hit. And she now starts to run. Admittedly, I could have cooed, by the way, because she wasn't even looking behind. If I just cooed here, this would have hit her. This would have been, literally been a three-second chase if I just cooed literally right there. But I was being greedy with five stacks at one gen remaining, even though I have a kill already. And I, I think this was actually a second kill as well. You know, I, I really could have just should have cooed it, but um, a little bit of a misplay on my part. But you know what I mean? We, we had that opportunity is what I want to put emphasis on. So we go ahead and hook her. That's the 2K. And at this point... You know, this is this is already where we need to actually win. When it comes to actually winning, you know, we just need to find somebody else. Worst case scenario, we would just camp them from a distance and, you know, if we need it. And that's our 3K, right? Now, we we're able to see Talita. We catch her on a mind game. She's, again, this is a dead zone. She's got nothing. Why do we throw? Do y'all wondering why I threw this yellow? Why did I throw my yellow if you're wondering that? I'm expecting her not to abandon from the left. I'm playing in a manner where she does abandon from the left. I can still ignore my yellow. And I can just rotate through into her because this is a dead zone. But what happens if she played this top? If after I hit her and she was looking to fake going to the left, fake going to the left, maybe she vaulted the window and then rotated back to the right. This yellow that I threw would not be active as she rotated to the right. I would be able to pick up that yellow as I rotated through it. And then if she went over the palette, I could play off of the animation with my speed differential, put a pink on the right side of that palette. And then she would not, through coup, through my yellow, through the pink in the force medium vault, she would not be able to make it over that window. I would force a guaranteed hit. She'd either get hit if she went over that window vault again, or she would get hit if she went back to the pallet. So we get this pink set up here. We deny her. Again, she's got nothing. She's just going basement. She knows it's GG's. You know, the lethality and the chase is too strong. And they do finish the last gen, you know, but it, it, at this point, it, right, it's just too late. She's on death hook. It's, it's a wrap. And that's our guaranteed 3k minimum for the win. And so I'm kind of just chilling at this point. I'm not really focusing as much on the 4k. I mean, I like to get it if I can. So that's why you do see me patrolling uh, patrolling these gates. But this is overall the satisfaction that I really gain and look to or I look to hope to achieve is just getting the 3k, you know, especially against a strong coordinated team. But uh, I digress. As we start to check the gates, we do find the Nia. I want to just get one last chase in. You know, we get our yellow. She doesn't pre-drop. This is very interesting. And this enables me to get this hit. By the way, this is like actually a big deal. She played this very smart here. Some people might be wondering, was it smart that she ran into us like this? Yes. Because if she didn't, then what could have happened if she went around the back? I would have had my yellow. She would have gone through my pink. I would have caught her before she got back to the pallet from the outside. It would have pushed her back into the inside. It would have pushed her into the corner. And after the hit, and then... I would just hit her because she would have nowhere else to go afterward. I would be able to down her. So she actually played it very smart. That was her best shot of getting out of the corner. But, again, nowhere she can go. You know, thankfully, this is Rotten Fields. This wasn't Cow Shed. You know what I mean, gang? Or Torment Creek, things like that. And that's her 4K. We earned a 4K here. And I could have hooked her. I was literally about to, but I was like, you know what? They played really well. And we're just going to give gate. You know, I, I really appreciated the match. I thought they played very well. We opened the gate. We let them leave. And that basically wraps it up. You know, she helped us out a lot, giving us all of those play with your food stacks, gang. You know, we farmed them like crazy. We really played around our understanding of what it is she was going to be doing. You know, not just as well what she was going to be doing, but playing around what the n other non-obsessions were also going to be doing, where they would be split from each other on different areas of the map, and who would possibly having to be doing things such as going for the unhook, going for, for the heals, things of that nature. You know what I mean, gang? But that does wrap up our second match. Um, you know, this this does. This is why I run play with your food, though, y'all. 
if we didn't have play with your food, not only would we have lost out on so much value in early lethality for getting these faster chases that we would be able to use to snowball even further, but we would have enabled the survivors in these matches to punish us even harder. You know, like there were there were a couple points where the obsessions tried to get close to us, but not only were they not getting close enough, but they rewarded us for it. They rewarded us for it. And I think they rewarded us more in a way than what would be gained if we would have ran some niche perk like Brutal Strength or Superior Anatomy for some reason. You know, one of those two perks for some strange reason, I guess you could say. Or if we ran something like Sloppy, which would have its strong reasons, you know, for committing off of a strong chase into another strong chase once we've ramped up. Or even just something like Pain Res or Jolt, which is just free regression on top of our fast chases. I really do think it was pinnacle that we had play with your food, that we performed as well as we did. You know, we had some strong maneuvers on our end, the survivors were very efficient, and it was how play with your food interacted based on our both our micro and macro decisions, coupled with how the survivors were doing certain generators and playing efficiently themselves, that allowed us to perform as well as we did. But other than that, gang, I think that just about wraps up everything I'd like to cover for this video. We're going to stick with two videos for, or excuse me, two matches for this one little deep dive because, little I say, because at this point the video is starting to get, you know, rather long. And I, I want to, I think it's a, we can go ahead and just call it here for that reason. Um, I hope everyone found this entertaining. You know, I, I go out of my way. I do everything that I can. And that's why I did what I did, especially in this video, to break everything down to step by step as much as i can to, to process every fr uh, every like frame reference of mine you know, every every thought you know thought of a thought you could say to that that is that stands behind why it is that i make the certain decisions that i do okay so i hope this video really really helps people makes it very clear you know they see why i run play with your food in in this build specifically how it helps save the best for last, both as a protection and a support benefit to your extra lethality. And with that, I hope y'all can also yourselves do well with it. You know, I hope this helps other clown players that watch me. I hope y'all are able to play using Play With Your Food in this build a lot better. So to, to wrap things up here again, if you like these matches, you know, if you like the content here and you want to see these matches live when I stream them, I stream on Twitch, you know, semi-regularly, uh, on over the same name as you see here my name is Aaron Ad. you can catch me there I also as well I have a very extensive clown guide excuse me gang we've been talking a lot here I have a very extensive clown guide that covers a whole lot of other facets uh, areas that I talked about in this video itself things like palette possession and how to use yellow and pink bottles you can look at my very extensive clown guide that I'll also link in the description as well but other than that, gang, again, I hope y'all really, really enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed making it. It was a, it was a doozy. It was very, uh, very much a long one by comparison. But other than that, you know, y'all have a nice day. Y'all take care, and I'll see y'all next time.